morning a good up good morning good afternoon and good evening to all the friends uh, respected guest speakers a wine speaker uh, and all the panelists and discussion for today's uh, session so today uh, on behalf of acns uh, uh, young neurosurgeon committee i welcome you for this yet another interesting education webinar which we conduct on every second and fourth a sunday for whole so purpose of education for young neurosurgeon today we have uh, professor tadashi watanabe and professor andre grotten hughes as one of the guest speakers and uh, dr nicolo marchesani as the wine speaker professor yoko kato as our uh, patron uh, who's the president of acns society uh, dr alberto who is a good friend of mine uh, and who's a expert in endoscopic neurosurgery so the best person to chair today's session and uh, the two discussant uh, dr byron salazar from cador and uh, dr irian uh, from albania uh, to moderate today's session i have uh, we have uh, dr khalid khan zadran who's i am basically from afghanistan but uh, the moment he's practicing in pakistan uh, dr manucher davlatov who's from tajikistan uh, dr ikech kwa uh, ania who is from nigeria dr kabulo dm who is from democratic republic of congo and who is co chair of uh, uh, young neurosurgeon society of africa and dr dragan jankovic who is from germany and who is at the moment doing uh, his fellowship at fujita health university uh, before we start the webinar i would request professor yoko kato to say a few opening uh, uh, comments for the young neurosurgeon Thank you very much for the welcome Uh, all of you, I think uh, uh, today that we have a very uh, special lectures from the two giants of the neurosurgery, uh, especially the Andre is a very common topic, but I think uh, so many tips of this uh, the surgery, and maybe we can uh, uh, have a listen and uh, we can get the more knowledge from him. And also Watanabe Sensei is an expert of the ex uh, endoscope. So maybe he can tell us how uh, less invasive treatment is uh, important for the, uh, our new, uh, near uh, future treatment. So let's thank you very much. So we can start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I would request uh, the chairman uh, for today's session, Dr. Alberto, to uh, make some comments about uh, about the speakers and about the, uh, the, the the topic which is interesting for the young neurosurgeon today, Dr. Alberto. Thank you, thank you, Sachin. Thank you uh, for the invitation to chair this session. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here because uh, I I personally know uh, all the three speakers today. Uh, we have, uh, as Professor Kato said, two giants in their fields: uh, Professor Watanabe and Professor Gottenhaus. Uh, they are very well known, uh, and uh, I think uh, for young neurosurgeons. Uh, this session will be uh, very useful uh, because uh, uh, endoscopy uh, nowadays uh, is something we really need for our practice for our patients uh, it can help reducing the invasiveness and extend uh, the results of our surgery so uh, both speakers uh, are expert in this field uh, and we also have uh, nicola marchesini who is a young neurosurgeon actually uh, working at my institution, uh, who will also talk about a very uh, intriguing topic, which is uh, uh, spinal trauma management in uh, developing countries. So uh, we are very eager to uh, learn uh, all the speakers' uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alberto. I would request Dr. Kabullo, who is the moderator uh, for today's session, to Uh, uh please kindly introduce uh, our first speaker uh, professor andre grotenius dr kabullo thank you so much dr sachin uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate to moderate this session uh, mm -hmm. i will introduce the first speaker uh, our first speaker is professor andre grotenius uh, he is a emeritus professor of neurosurgery radboud university medical center Nij Megan in the Netherlands. So he is uh, the president of the International Society of uh, Neurosurgical Technology and Instrument Invention. He is also a president of the ANS Foundation for Research in uh, Neurological Surgery. Uh, 
Uh, he's the past president of the European Association of Neurological Societies and past second vice president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical uh, Societies. He's also the chairman of WFNS Audit Committee. Professor uh, Andre is a recipient of uh, the AANS International Lifetime Recognition Award uh, in April 2017, and uh, is also a recipient of uh, the A. Uh, EANS Medal of Honor in October 2022, recipient of the Life Service Awards, Croatian Neurosurgical Society in November 2022. So today, uh, Professor Andre is going to talk about uh, how to choose the best approach for anterior fossa meningioma. So Professor, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much for the nice words, nice introduction. And um, let's see if I can share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, Prof, we can see it. Perfect. Well, you see there are quite a number of slides, so I um, start immediately with not trying to... Yes. <clears throat> My topic is, as you mentioned, the anterior skull base meningiomas. And um, um, discuss with you or tell you how you choose the best approach to these lesions. Meningiomas, I mean, this is a surgical disease. We don't have a lot of other options. There is no real chemotherapy and uh, redo surgery is only an option for maybe later on, not, not very often the primary option for these lesions. So this is a disease for neurosurgeons. Surgery is still the mainstay of the treatment of meningioma. And very often they can grow rather large before they become symptomatic because the growth rate is uh, low and um, the, the brain first adapts to that before it becomes um, symptomatic. It's not only in the anterior skull base, it is throughout a whole uh, cranial fold that any intervention that we do as surgeons will depend on how we approach it. So our planning of the procedure is really essential. Generally speaking, we have approaches from above through the cranial vault, through the skull. And there are a number of them. And you still have to know them because they are still in use and should be used nowadays for many of these lesions. Um, and this is not even a complete list. You can even do more than that. But just to show you the typical uh, frontal lateral, supraorbital, pterional, bifrontal, suprafrontal uh, approaches, um, one that is maybe, I mean, this was the mainstay when, uh, when skull-based surgery uh, developed in the late 80s and early 90s, that was the orbitozygomatic craniotomy. And, um, and I was not doing my residency, I hadn't seen it. So I had to develop that um, to look to others who were doing that and do it in the lab. And I always love to do that in one piece. So the, the trick is that you, with the zygoma, also take the orbital roof with it. And this gives you a very low basal approach. And the reason doing this is that you avoid um, 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 much of brain retraction. It's not it's inevitable that there will be some retraction, but you really come from very, very low onward. That was the essence of it. But this is arduous. This is a time-consuming procedure, um, not only the opening, but also the closure, which should be very meticulous. If you don't do that very well, especially with the zygoma, the patient really have problems afterwards with, for example, chewing. Lateral supraorbital, this is not a classic eyebrow, but the lateral supraorbital, this was popularized by Juha Hernesnemi from, from Helsinki. And um, I've seen him doing this in two minutes. That was just amazingly uh, quick. But that's the, uh, the, the, the crosses at the, uh, the so-called keyhole, where Jashigal already mentioned the keyhole of the approach, the pterionin. And um, 
this is where it is centered around. And then the supraorbital craniotomy through an eyebrow incision. This is something I started with in 1988 and um, um, was initially considered somewhat weird that we would make incision in, a visible incision in the eyebrow. But um, it's now a well-accepted approach to the, the frontal base. Essentially, is these steps that I will go through with you very briefly. The essence is first that when the patient is on the operating table, and this is what people sometimes forget, then you elevate the head. So look, it's elevating the head, and then you lift, extend the hand, head. And that will allow the frontal lobe already to fall away from the skull base. If you forget that step, then it's still more swollen before you open the cisterns. And then of course, the rotation of the head is absolutely essential because you hardly need any rotation if you want to go to the ipsilateral optic nerve or lateral of it. Think for example, for a picomanorism. But if you want to go to the tuberculum cellae or the planum sphenoidale, then you need about 30 degree to have the best view of both optic nerves and the tuberculum and the planum. For the more anterior parts, you even have to extend it more and then have 45 degrees to have the possibility to see the cribriform plate. So it all depends on where you want to go. An olfactory groove, you even need more. And if you have 60 degrees turnaround, you even can approach contralateral uh, structures. These are the little parts of it, uh, and but very essential. So um, if you forget about this and just think, well, I, I keep the patient straight and I just do 45 degrees, you can maybe struggle if you have a sphenoid meningioma, for example, because you have not um, position the patient optimally to, to reach that. So don't forget the planning part of your procedure is very important. Think of it several times. Try to imagine that. Have this 3D image in your, in your, in your mind. When you look to the MRI, the, the coronal, the sagittal, the axial views, and then you see and you are thinking about, okay, here is the sylvian fissure. I open this, and then I, here I get CSF first. I approach it first laterally. And then so you have, you, you are thinking. And then you decide on how you will get there in the best way and the least traumatic way. Typically, this is, uh, this is the superorbital approach. It is indeed in the eyebrow, the lateral half of the eyebrow. Uh, it never extends to the, uh, the superorbital nerve. It should not, at least. And you easily can feel where it is, even with yourself. You feel the little dimple here in this, in this orbital roof um, where the nerve is. So make a mark where that is so that you don't extend medially because the complete numbness of the skull is not very pleasant for the patient. And then typically it is a burr hole just underneath the tem muscle, the temporalis muscle that is just pushed away and not incised. Um, so this is, um, this is an access to uh, the frontal skull base. Um, there is one essential part that I want to show you here. This is something we, we published as an um, approach to the interpeduncular fossa, so the, the anterior part of the, of, of the brainstem, of the pons. Um, it sounds odd, but that is also possible. But the essence is here on, the, on D, because if you have done the craniotomy, then the inner table, the inner table, not the outer one, leave that bone there, but the inner table, is drilled away, completely drilled away until it is flush with the orbital roof. And then you go more deep down and all these little bony spurs on the orbital roof, you drill them away extra dually. That gives you those essential one, two millimeters extra. And that means you don't have to retract one, two millimeters more just to expose that. And you see when you open in, in this position, just 
vertically down is the ipsilateral optic nerve. That's very, very easy and convenient. It's not a difficult approach. So um, the lesions we can um, approach with, um, with the superorbital craniotomy is um, indeed the orbital roof itself, um, the clinoids, um, both anterior and posterior, but for posterior, you need more um, turning of the head, um, the cavernous sinus basal frontal lobe, not superficially. You don't see a lot of that. Gyrus rectus, Sylvia Fisher. Um, you can go to the hippocampus. You can do an amygdala hippocampectomy through this approach. And most of the, uh, the, the, the anterior part of the circle of Willis and also the, um, the P1, P2, su superior cerebellar artery, and of course the, uh, the, the, the basal artery tip itself also. And in the midline, Olfactory groove and Krista Gully is somewhat more arduous to do, but mainly to work in Celli. Think of the anterior third ventricle, craniopharyngiomas, the stalk, as I mentioned, the interpeduncular fossa. So you see, this is this is this has become, at least for me, a workhorse to the frontal skull base. And yes, since many, many years, we have already also approaches from below. That means through the nose. Um, this was developed for pituitary adenomas, but it developed into, um, you could say, transphenoidal and transnasal craniotomies of the skull base. You can do a lot through this. Transfrontal, you can reach up to the frontal sinus, the so-called draft procedures not very common for us as neurosurgeons. Uh, the, through the cribriform plate, planum sphenoidale, uh, tuberculum celli, the cella itself, of course, then all the parts of the clivus. And it depends a little bit on this nasal bone, how far you can really go down, but you usually can reach the odontoid. So this is the development from below. So you see, we have a whole armamentarium to go to the skull base from both above and below. If you look to below, I will not discuss the, uh, so it is all a midline approach. Um, so the more lateral to the, the CP angle, uh, I will not discuss or to uh, the, well, um, the, the craniocervical junction, that's not part of my talk. Um, what was mentioned, this was developed by Kassam and his group at that time when he was in Pittsburgh, that you have to consider that um, this, these are not easy procedures and also not short procedures. They are very long procedures. And we still struggle with the reconstruction. The difficulty is not drilling away a lot of bone. You can make big, big holes in the skull base through the nose, a lot but it is very difficult to close it in a proper way. So initially you start with pituitary surgery or you deal with CSF leaks, traumatic CSF leaks, for example. And um, um, the, the last is when you deal with the diseases in the coronal plane, and maybe even lateral of the optic nerve, that's extreme. That's a very, very difficult. Mostly also because nobody really has the experience. They are, these are rare lesions. So I wanted to talk about how you choose your approach. First, very simple, of course, is the location. Where is the lesion? Sounds easy, but look at it. And I mean, in Joma especially, we want to find out where did it originate? Not always possible, but in many cases, yes. And that origin is important because you want to attack that that is where you need to go through and drill the bone away and the, and the dura, even at the skull base, to reach a good resection. So it is location. And in the skull base, in the anterior skull base, you have, of course, in the midline, olfactory groove, um, planum, tuberculum, and laterally you have sphenoid wing, sphenoorbital meningiomas that usually uh, present with. Um, um, protrusion of the eye, and the real orbital meningiomas. 
that actually this I cannot talk about today because um, when we discuss about the approaches, let's say from above and below, those lateral meningiomas will not be approached from below. So there you, your only choice is a craniotomy. But here in, in, in the midline, yes, you have, you always can think of both approaches, but I want to tell you why you should choose the one or the other. I mean, this is anatomy and I should not discuss this very long for all of you. I just remind you that the cribriform plate, well, the, actually these are the, 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 the apmoid bone, there is the, the olfactory nerve. What we think as the olfactory nerve is the bulk of the olfactory nerve going to the cribriform plate and then leading all these little filaments uh, through the bone. And that extends quite far. And you can see that on a scan. I, I still prefer in case of meningioma to have uh, not only an MRI scan, but also CT scan because of skull-based meningiomas are attached to bone. And uh, in former times, so the, when I was trained and also afterwards, we very often also did angiograms to see about the vascularization. We don't do that anymore because we have in the MRI scan, you have already an idea about the vascularization. And a lot of that is still coming from uh, branches of the external carotid artery, even in the skull base. And we don't think very often uh, in embolization, but that is an, an option you should keep in mind. Well, the second factor in choosing an approach is the size. Yeah, that's very simple. I mean, you have small meningiomas, and that um, that is a difference to let's say the the medium sized. These are more the typical size meningiomas that we see because patients can and will then develop some some symptoms. And we have, of course, the larger ones. The larger ones really pose already difficulties because you see how far they can extend in um, also in from the midline. This is still a midline meningioma, but I mean, this is nearly going to, um, to the lateral part. And then of course, and in meningiomas, that's not even very rare. Fortunately, it is rare, but these are the, the giant meningiomas. And with all, all our modern technology, these are still formidable, formidable surgeries, extremely, as you can see, because here the whole bone and you was already involved. It is difficult to know even where is the vasculature and where are the, the anterior arteries. So these are, this is really, really, this is still also meningioma, but you can think of that this, think of a supraorbital eyebrow incision is of course of no use when dealing with such a lesion. You can understand that. Here, the only approach is, of course, a, um, a, a bifrontal. You need a wide exposure to even have the possibility to, uh, to think of resecting this. And then now and then, but we know this is nowadays uh, more the grade two, uh, you have meningiomas that originates, especially at the, uh, the apmoid bone, that invade into the paranasal sinuses. Initially, we thought this is an esthesioneuroblastoma, but it turned out to be a meningioma. And then um, it, it, it's more um, preferable to, to go from below if, if already the sinuses are involved. So you see the size and location are two major factors in choosing the proper approach. But now we come to some more specific points. And um, um, what you have to study is how the meningioma is related to the neurovascular structures. Here you see that, that's a sphenoid meningioma. And you see that it is completely enveloping the carotid artery. And you see that it is already diminished in diameter. It's already smaller, so it is compressed a bit. Um, 
an approach from below will not allow you to properly deal with the largest part of this tumor. And even with the craniotomy, it will be extremely difficult to, to think of a, of a complete resection. And this will be different if this is an, an, a patient of 30 years old or 85 years old. That's, that's a difference in what you want to do. So this is, um, uh, otherwise you maybe even have to think of sacrificing the carotid and do a bypass before. So these are all options you have to consider. You already see that um, a lot of factors come into play. And, and the same is here. If you see these here, this is, this is from the clinoid, but then you know that um, probably the carotid is not really enveloped, but this is a hyperostotic here. So where is the optic nerve? Very, very um, clear to, to find that before you start doing a surgery and choosing the approach for this. And the same here. Well, this, is, um, this was something that was sent to us because they know that we also do some approaches from below, but this is not easy. Uh, it's halfway already crossing here in the midline. And we, here we see um, not clearly, I think there is an anterior artery there also. So um, although this is a tuberculum cell meningioma of medium size, it is not too big. Um, we decided against a, an approach from, um, from below. Same here, it's, um, that is a possibility, but here you see that the, uh, you nicely see the anterior. So this is, it's, um, you can free it from there. So this is something that you can most probably deal with properly from below. But it depends on how you look to, if this would extend laterally from, from this area, I would choose a different approach that I come to later on. And the same here, but this is a case that I will discuss later on. You see that um, this is not very nicely demarcated. It's somewhat irregular. And you see that the branches of the anterior cerebral artery and the ACOM are more or less involved in the process. So doing this from below would be uh, tricky, but this is the case I will discuss at the end. So the next factor in choosing the approach is of course, the aim of your surgery. And you maybe would think it's always total resection, but that's not true. Sometimes you, on purpose, leave something behind or attach to an important structure and decide later on to either send it for radio surgery or follow it up before it grows. Um, sometimes just decompression, optic nerve decompression. Um, although once I made a mistake in that, I did a partial excision um, in an, in an 85 year old um, lady uh, who was still very vital. Um, and had a huge meningioma, well, actually on her left side, um, and ha had dysphasia. So, but I didn't want to deal with all the, 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 the branches of the, of the MCA that were attached on the posterior part of the meningioma. And I thought, well, she's 85. Um, when I do, an, 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 I don't go for it, radical. Um, some part leaving behind will not make a um, big deal. The problem was that she returned to the hospital when she was 95, with clearly growing meningioma. Um, so sometimes you can, um, you can have difficulties in uh, making such a decision. Um, the same is for cavernous sinus meningiomas. I think that Dr. Cato also knows that we, when skull base surgery was developing, we were doing all cavernous sinus meningiomas as 
um, total as possible. And all these patients had ophthalmoplegia. I was closed and big swan this was, but the CT scan looked very nice afterwards. There was no meningioma until we realized that our treatment should be at least better than the natural course of the disease. And many of those, especially smaller skull base, uh, cavernous sinus meningiomas, don't grow a lot and they go very slow. So you can wait and scan or only remove the extra cavernous part and maybe deal with radio surgery with the other part. So this is what we learned from an absolute commando approach, removing big parts of the bone um, and, 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 and even from below um, to just have a total excision. That is not the case anymore. For example, such meningiomas completely involving the cavernous sinus, you can remove a lot of this, but the goal of this surgery is not a total removal. And now I will discuss the radiological appearance. You would say, well, that's easy. Meningioma, they enhance very nicely. So I can see it's a meningioma. Yeah, that's fine. But there are other things where we have to look at. So it's not only the size, as I showed you, small, medium, somewhat larger, and even larger. But even in this small meningioma, as you can see here, there is edema in the adjacent, in the, here on the, on, the, on the left side, the left patient side. Um, gyrus rectus. So, and in this meningioma, it's more on the right side. What does that tell you? It does tell you that the, that the pile surface of the brain towards the meningioma in that area is not so well developed anymore. So there is not the best arachnoid plane. And that makes you giving the choice. And of course, here you see that this meningioma have given a huge amount of edema. It's usually because of the venous uh, uh, congestion that they have of both frontal lobes. If you go here bifrontally, in that last case, bifrontally, and have a retractor on both of these frontal lobes, that patient will have fixed severe fixed deficits of his frontal lobe function. So think of that. It's better to go from the non-dominant side, only unilateral. So radiological appearance is important, T1, but also look to the T2. And that is more, even more important nowadays to even think of, it's not decisive, but think of going through the nose, or going from above. I write here supraorbital, but it can also be frontolateral or pterion. If there is a lot of edema, as you see, and it is not super big, um, then it is preferable to work from below and not touch the brain from the start. Because when we do go from above, we have to deal with the brain from the very start of after dural opening to deal with the meningioma. And then we look if there is a cortical cuff present. What is a cortical cuff? That's a piece of brain that is between the meningioma and the anterior cerebral arteries. Because then if you go from below, you deal with the meningioma, but only at the very end of the procedure, and even not possible then, it's very difficult to even start dissecting the arteries of the capsule of the meningioma. Yeah, there have been some cases described where, um, where there was a rupture of that artery and followed by a frontal lobe infarction. And then, that's, that's something that you um, um, could discuss, but that is what generally I, I look to that. 
if it is hyper intense on T2, it usually is cellular meningioma. That means that is the softer type of meningioma. So easy to decompress with your Q cell or with suction tube and bipolars and, um, and, and Kretz if you don't have a Q cell. But if it is hypo intense, dark on T2, that are the typical fibrous, very hard, rubbery meningiomas. And of course, if you see vascular encasement, that is something that, at least for me, precludes the endonasal approach because I cannot deal with that um, in, a, in a proper way. So we have these factors in choosing an approach, location, size, the involvement of neurovascular structures, you, the goal of the surgery, and the radiological appearance. But there are two more that are not so well appreciated. And um, um, that is the patient's expectations or the patient's choice. If the patient comes in your office and say, I come to you because I know you do endoscopic endonasal. I want you to do this. And I look at the image and say, this is not the right approach. They, they, they often have already, I, I mean, they look, they look into the internet about the disease and not only about the disease, I can tell you, every patient nowadays will look in the internet uh, to get information about you as the neurosurgeon. They know everything you have published. They know what um, uh, the things that is are available on the internet, they will read because you will be the person that they, um, that they have to trust dealing with a brain tumor of them. So that is what they will do. And the last factor, that's also the experience of yourself as a neurosurgeon. Such a meningioma should never be the first endonasal case you do in your life. If you, I think the first meningioma I did in, in 1996, but at that time I had already done 200 pituitaries endoscopically and nasally. So I had more experience already in, in dealing with the, 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 the nasal part and with CSF leaks. Although then at the end of the 90s, I stopped again because the CSF leak rate was simply too high. And only after the nasal vascularized nasal flap came, that I, I slowly went back to it as a possibility. But your experience is also very important. If you are very good in the pterional approach of these lesions, please do that. Because it, it's the result that counts. Your patient will not ask you to give them a nice video of the approach. They want to, doctor, can you please cure me? This is what they ask of you. And you do what you are best in. And that's not always um, what is fancy. Think of that, that's an important factor. And these are all the factors that I think are really necessary in choosing the right approach. I will discuss a case, uh, some cases with you quickly. This female consults an ENT surgeon because she had unilateral nasal obstruction. And when she breathes, she has this whistling tone through the nose. And she has periorbital pain. She is known to have nasal polyposis, diabetes, hypocholesteremia, she is obese, okay. Um, and an MRI scan is made. Well, here you see meningioma. That is obvious. But this is this coronal. And now the NT surgeon sent it to us because they say this is the meningioma extending into the sinus. So you should better approach that from below and deal with this as a neurosurgeon. But I said this radiological appearance means you study all available sequences. Meningioma, the other lesion. But here I see the dura is completely intact. The skull base is not breached. How is that possible? 
Well, it's very obvious. Look at this, just a T1. And this is from in Injoma. And you see that the carotid artery is just here uh, enveloped, not fully. There is a slight opening, but more than 90% is around it. And now you see in, in a flare, these are two different lesions, obviously. This turned out, to, to what is the approach? Well, an ENT surgeon removed that mucosil from the nose. That's the approach. And I mean, in Joma, we had a wait and scan because she had no complaint whatsoever, had a 100% visual acuity and no problem at all. And she's 64. So let's, let's wait and see what happens with that meningioma. So we didn't jump into that. So that was the, the approach. But now let's assume that she develops a visual field defect in the right temporal field and her vision starts to decline. What would you do then? Because now apparently the meningioma becomes symptomatic. How would you approach that? Would you go from below because it is not fully enveloping the, the carotid artery or the supraorbital? Do you think about it? Oh, for me, it was, was clear that we chose the, um, the superorbital approach because you have to think about it. An endoscopic endonasal approach is straight up. So it's from inferior to superior. And therefore, that's in anything that's in that line is very nicely to, 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 to get to. So if it is inside the cellar boundaries, like in pituitary adenoma, perfect. If there is significant inferior extension, so if it is already in the sphenoid sinus, perfect. If it is supracellar, but in the midline, a smaller meningioma extending up to the floor of the third ventricle, perfect. If it is subchiasmatic, retrochiasmatic, perfect. If it is underneath the nerve, very good. Anything else, lateral of the nerve, suprachiasmatic, when you have to deal and then manipulate the chiasm from below, that's usually not the proper approach. And microsurgically, you have a greater control and greater freedom of manipulation of the vessels and the nerve. So you expose, the, you drill open the, the, the optic canal and you expose the, the whole carotid artery. And so you, you, are, you are safe in doing that. So therefore, it is good for anything that is either pre-chiasmatic because that is more difficult from below. Suprachiasmatic, paracellar extensions, so over the lateral from carotid and optic nerve. If it is larger than three centimeters, because for me, that was always the line, three centimeters is about what I can do from below. And of course, all the lesions with vascular encasement. And this was an interesting case. This was a 53-year-old female. She lived in northern Sweden, um, and she is an acclaimed restaurant chef. She have, have, Her restaurant has two Michelin stars, and she also runs a nationwide catering service. Um, she has quite uh, some comorbidities, BMI of 41, um, um, obstructive sleep apnea, panic attacks. Uh, this, um, But her problem is that since a couple of years, her smell is diminishing, especially on the left side. And that's a difficulty for her because she is the chef. She has to cook and she doesn't smell it right anymore. So this is this small lesion. 21 by 19 by 90 millimeters was it exact. So two by two by two. Very nice. You can do this but it is causing her a loss of smell on one, at least on one side, it is already severe. 
And then in three years, it has grown three millimeters in each direction. So more or less indeed a millimeter per year. And she's concerned. So she consults a neurosurgeon. How do you approach that? From below? If you do it endonasally, transcribiform. Transcribiform means that you destroy the smell. It's gone. So she was offered gamma knife for this lesion. Another neurosurgeon offered her a bifrontal craniotomy. And he told her, that's what I always do with, uh, with all my older um, frontal base meningiomas. So the standard approach. Or maybe the supraorbital craniotomy, endoscopic endonasal. She went to a lot of places. She went to the USA, but I, well, at least sent the pictures there. But it was too costly. They wanted to have $350,000 for the procedure, an endoscopic endonasal procedure and told her that it would be not easy to preserve her olfactory function. So that was not a real option for her. So she, she was shopping around. Um, and then finally she came here to, to, to me. I was one of the, the options. Um, and this is, well, this is in Dutch, don't we? But uh, I have something mentioned here. At the bulbous, so the first, the, the right olfactory nerve is identified. And at the bulbous, the nerve is coated with fibrin glue. That is something that I do since the 90s. And that we published there actually in 1998 already, but most people will never have read it. Um, we did that for CP angle tumors, for transtemporal pretrosal approach. When we see nerves that are at risk of operative trauma, either being exposed for hours uh, through the light of the operating microscope or with a bipolar, or maybe the suction that you touch it with the suction several times, we coat the nerve with a very, very thin translucent, um, because fibrin glue is translucent, layer. And that gives, that protects the nerve. And we have done that since. So this is just a little trick I want to um, um, uh, give you as a, as a possibility um, to do. It helps. Actually, we saw it, it has not completely diminished, but it diminished our, the, the olfactory dysfunction afterwards. And this is the email that I received this um, um, about uh, seven weeks later. And I, it was something I was not aware of, but she said, I have bought 10 different smell oils and, and was exercising her smell, but it, apparently it helps. And she, what she said, I thought that I was in a candy world when I went to, into the supermarket. Um, her smell on the left side normalized actually after the surgery and on the right side may, remained intact. She allowed me to show these pictures of you and this is her in her restaurant. And, um, and here is the cosmetic result. You see it here. You see, because she has no really full eyebrows, but this is a very decent uh, cosmetic result. And more the functional result, of course, is, is important. And here I am, and this was a case where in such a young lady, um, I was surprised to realize that she was not aware, well, maybe not fully aware of that she was going blind. And that's amazing. It happens in children with craniopharyngiomas that they uh, run into things and they are nearly blind before they even uh, notify the parents, but also in adults and especially in frontal meningiomas. But then it turned out that she was running into a, a, a door and she was, so um, her husband was saying, you have, to, you have to see an eye doctor, you probably need glasses. Well, that was not the case. She didn't need glasses, but a CT scan was made immediately. 
and already on this um, um, on this primary CT scan, you see that it extends. And this is what I said: so you easily can now find where the origin is of this lesion. The origin is here at the cribriform plate, the apnoid bone, obviously. And then this meningioma. Well, you would say I approach this from below. I discussed it with, I, I presented this also in Pittsburgh, and they were absolutely 100% a case for endonasal endoscopic approach. But to be honest, that was not for me. You could argue this is very nice if you remove this here. But for me, this complete frontal extension is extremely difficult to reach. At it. But they said, if you debulk it, it will expose itself easily. And then look where the anterior artery is. There is no cuff in between. So for me, this was a case uh, for a craniotomy. And, uh, but as um, I, I just mentioned it, uh, people who have much more experience, like the Pittsburgh group, they would absolutely do this endoscopically and nasally. And then if you see this with the, uh, with the huge edema, that could have been indeed an argument to do it endonasally. So I agree with them because they say, if you touch that nerve, but it's so irregular, this uh, young female, so 30 years, and it was actually an, an, a, a great toe, meaning joma. As you can see here, also the, the, this lateral extension is, something I have really difficulty with dealing from, uh, from below. And then the last case I will, um, and because then I come to the, what I wanted to tell about it, uh, combining an endoscope and a microscope. Um, he, he, was, he has no medical history, although he retired two years ago and his wife said that since that time, and she blames the retirement, because she said now he has nothing to do anymore. He is, um, he is just only sitting in a chair doing nothing the whole day. But now he has a seizure and he has fever. So they do a lumbar puncture and that is positive PCR for herpes virus. So he probably has a herpes virus encephalitis, but he quickly deteriorates after the lumbar puncture. So they make a CT scan. And um, there you see the, uh, the, the CT scan already, the calcification. And here you see again where it is from. This is partly the planum. This is more the planum still extending just to the cribriform plate. And also quite some edema. But if you study it further, and that is what I mentioned, don't stop with the slice and say, oh, meningioma, clear, schedule it. No, 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 study it completely. Oh, because this was this case where this was not sharply demarcated. And I think this would be more difficult to dissect it um, from below in a safe manner. But going back here, this was something I would indeed do from below, from endonasal. So what was the solution? The solution was to combine endoscopic endonasal and the supraorbital approach in this one procedure. However, that needs uh, two surgeons and both needs to be experienced in, in, in endoscopy. Um, navigation can is then really helpful. The amount of equipment you have, the nasal equipment, and you have the sterile craniotomy equipment, and so you need an OR nurse who is very strict with you, and make sure that you don't mix up with that. And then you can see this was our senior OR nurse, and she was clearly, clearly keeping her hand here that nobody was touching anything that belonged to one of the, the sides of it. 
This is my colleague, Eric van Lindert, who was, a, he was trained with Professor Panetsky in Mainz and very experienced in, in endoscopy. So he is doing the endonasal part while I'm doing the supraorbital part, but you see how close it is next together. But you work together. You see, at, at, at one point, you see each other, actually. That is how it, how it looks like. And there you have the two, um, two screens that you can see with picture in picture and, and the navigation. But it also um, helps in enclosure. You see, we have already, um, you, you, you close it from below. And then from above, you start rinsing. And from through the nose, you can see if there is still fluid coming through the nose. And when that is not, then you can um, then close the, with the nasal septal flap properly and, and also from above. We only have done that in, in, in those nearly uh, 25 years, only 14 times, um, and never had a single leak afterwards, post-op, and also not a single infection. But of course, the number is very small. So if that would be the next case and has an infection, then you already have 6%. So uh, percentages are very dangerous to, to mention in, 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 in small numbers. But in those cases, there were selected cases, and this was possible to remove that meningioma completely. In conclusion, the surgical outcome of scolvis meningiomas, and that is really, that's the essence, it's about case selection. And of course, also your surgical experience. And I think that both approaches from above and below can achieve good results. But again, you have to select the patients properly. So know when it is best coming from below, know when it is better to, uh, to do a craniotomy. And then um, you should be uh, familiar with both techniques. And I think nowadays that is in the training already involved. Um, being able to choose also the best reconstruction of the skull base effect. And of course, you always need to prepare to deal with unexpected situations. Thank you for your attention. I think, yeah, that was uh, one of 40 minutes. I will uh, stop my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Andre Grotenius. That was a very good overview of how to select the approach for the anterior skull-based meningioma. In fact, uh, there are some comments about uh, about uh, whether we can get the recording of today's presentation by some young neurosurgeons. Definitely, the tips which you showed said was very, very important. I would request uh, Dr. Alberto, who is the chairperson for today's session, to make comments about uh, Professor Andre Grotenius' presentation. Dr. Alberto? Yes, Sachin. Uh, thank you, Professor Grotenius, for this wonderful and extremely clear presentation, as usual. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's very important for young neurosurgeons to uh, listen such uh, uh, great presentations because uh, actually uh, one of the most difficult uh, steps uh, during you know uh, the the decision uh, about a, a patient is to uh, uh, of course give an indication for surgery but also to select the the best approach. And this is uh, always uh, very difficult, also because it depends on several factors, as uh, uh, Professor Grotenhaus uh, uh, extremely clearly uh, told us. Uh, I think uh, the experience of uh, the surgeon is uh, crucial. Uh, he uh, said clearly that uh, the same case can be approached in different ways based on uh, the experience of uh, a neurosurgeon. And there is often not a right way to approach a tumor and a wrong way to approach a tumor. Uh, there are only different ways and both have some pros and some cons. So I don't want to uh, talk too much because I see there are questions. Uh, I uh, think Dragan Jankovic uh, raised his hand. So please, Dragan. Yes, yes uh, good afternoon to all. And thank you very much, Professor, for the great presentation. Um, based on your experience, I have one question. Uh, what is your opinion about preoperative embolization in meningioma surgery? Is it necessary? 
Is it just for giant meningioma? Can you tell us something about it? Um, yes, I think it is. It, it, it nowadays starts to be a more or less forgotten uh, possibility to do so. Um, as I mentioned in former times, we did angiogram, CT scan and angiogram to diagnose meningiomas. And then we saw sometimes huge vascularization. I thought, because meningiomas can be very bloody procedures and you can lose quite some blood in, during the surgery. Um, so in, when I think back to the 80s, we did more embolizations than we do nowadays. Um, but it, it should not be um, a, a kind of standard always because it is not always necessary. And it, there is, um, I, I had a very tragic um, situation when I was much younger. Um, the patient had an embolization, so went to the embolization of a huge midline frontal basal meningioma. And at the end of the procedure, she was nearly blind. So she was, it was very, so maybe due to the contrast medium to some swelling that came out and then decided to immediately go ahead with the surgery in order to decompress her optic nerves. But at the end of the surgery, she was not nearly blind, she was completely blind. I probably should have waited uh, give her some some steroids and waited to see what, what, what why this because her vision was well somewhat diminished before, but that is also one of the risks. You see some swelling, and um, I have also seen that some of these hypercellular soft uh, meningiomas with embolization can turn into a very difficult manageable meningiomas become much more rubbery. And that is not an advantage um, in the first place. So it should be it should be in your mind that um, if you see that and look at the T2 images on an MRI scan, you when you see a lot of big uh, black uh, structures inside that meningioma, uh, first consider if it is not an hemangiopericytoma because sometimes they are much more vascularized and they should be embolized. Uh, or it's so that it is not a meningioma, but something else. I once had this um, renal carcinoma metastasis that that was considered to be meningioma, but it was a very, 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 very hypervascularized uh, metastasis. So then it is better to embolize, but um, it's in, in many cases it is, it is not. And it's not only the big ones. Sometimes it can help with the smaller ones, also small to medium sized, if it is very vascular. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see other raised hands, but before uh, listening to this, uh, the following questions, I would like to ask uh, our discussants to uh, spend some words uh, commenting on this presentation. Uh, Abida, are you online? He Abida? But, um... Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to uh, give some uh, comments, please? Hello, Professor Grutenius. Hello, Professor Cardo. Good to see you. Good to see you. That was a fantastic presentation, Professor, and very clear and lucid. I must say, you know, the exact indications of surgery, and as you mentioned, that apart from the location, the clinical. Uh, severity of symptoms, like suppose in a tuberculum cell meningioma, the extent of visual deficit also, you know, uh, will suggest the difficulty of the surgery. Yes. The more, the more uh, the visual deficit, the more difficult will be the surgery. Absolutely. Similarly, similarly, the edema that you showed is also a very important factor because here we do see a lot of huge tumors. The patients come to us pretty mm -hmm. late. And, you know, these are some of the factors that uh, help us in making the decision. And as you said, for cavernous sinus meningioma, the whole paradigm has shifted, you know, from first going into the cavernous sinus and then uh, removing, trying to remove it, but now just, you know, doing what is necessary. But that was a great lecture. Thank you, Professor Grotinius. Thank you, Abhita. And, and, and uh, greetings to Atul. Yes, yes, I will tell him, I will tell him. 
Thank you, Abida, and maybe uh, Arion. Are you here, Arion? I am. I am here. I was just yes. uh, turning on the camera and the mic. Uh, <laughs> um, I was fascinated, and I, I believe many of us would share the same opinion. So, Professor Grotenhal, uh, who is, uh, uh, thank you so very much for that uh, very wonderful presentation. It's always a pleasure to be around uh, on the work, a wonderful work that uh, Professor Kada and her team prepares. This is one of those lectures of uh, to the point, detailed, with enough information to provide a, a, a wonderful uh, structure for every young neurosurgeon to start thinking on a near future career for cases that uh, you presented. You dealt with the way that uh, such a case can be approached before well in advance, starting with a clinic before you even uh, navigate the ideas of how to approach it. And I am uh, very grateful to have had the opportunity to uh, attend your lecture. So thank you very much for taking the time uh, throughout your years of experience to put together these thoughts and then uh, distill it uh, for your today lecture. Outstanding, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, Arion, and maybe also Professor Oleksandr Vozniak uh, from Ukraine can give uh, some comments. Thank you very much. So I'm not, I'm not a discussant uh, this time, but uh, Professor Gretenius, thank you very much. Uh, great lecture, very deep analysis of the material, very academical. Thank you very much. I re really, I enjoy it. Uh, I, we have heard your option about uh, pre-op embolization. It's a one point where discussable, uh, but uh, I'd like to ask you about two uh, other points. The first, the pre-op administration of uh, corticosteroids for patients with basal meningioma and the uh, use of lumbar drain, drain for during surgery for, base, for skull base meningiomas. Well, go, coming to that last point, the lumbar drainage, I never use. Me too. That's, uh, no, no, that's, um, I would not dare to, in the smaller ones, it wouldn't make sense to do it. In the bigger ones, as I showed you, and some with a lot of edema, that would be even dangerous. I um, Usually you choose the approach so that even in, big, in a big case, you first go to the area where you can release CSF. I mean, that's a very basic neurosurgical principle. If you go for a CP angle, you first open the cisterna magna, you release the CSF, cerebellum becomes slack. I always told my residents, you have won the case. Now you can just slowly go ahead. No swollen cerebellum, et cetera. You have to release CSF, but not by lumbar drainage. The only way I use it, um, was in, in the subtemporal approach of some lesions that could sometimes help in, um, especially from the left side, in reducing the initial retraction that is necessary to expose uh, the supratemporal area. But for the frontal basal, I would not do it. And steroids, well, that, that, that's a little bit of discussion. Um, I would, it, it was standard uh, to, to give that for many, many years. Um, we don't do it now because it was claimed that uh, there was a higher incidence of post-operative um, in infections, pneumonias, etc. And if you see that big edema, we have this Pavlov reflex of visible edema means corticosteroids. But this is what we see on the scan is not really this edema. It, it is cytotoxic. It's because of the venous congestion. The big tumor is um, just compressing the venous drainage. And that gives this, it's really swollen. And if you open this, if you do the surgery in these cases, the brain is like a wet sponge. Mm -hmm. And that's, and steroids don't help in that. 
And the same is uh, before somebody would ask it, seizure medication. Now we don't do it prophylactically if they have seizures afterwards. And yes, that can happen. Certainly, if, especially from above. Um, seizures is one of the risks still post-op epilepsy in large lesions. Um, then we treat it afterwards, but we don't give it prophylactically. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Maybe uh, also uh, Dr. Dilshod Mabadaliev wants to uh, give some uh, comments. Dilshod? Are you there, Dilshod? Maybe. He's still muted and only his yeah. picture here. But yeah. so we, we maybe we, we can, can go ahead. Questions. We can go ahead with the questions. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we can start with uh, Dr. Serik Bey. Uh, can you please introduce yourself before uh, uh, asking the question, please? And unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Abulai Serikbay. I'm 29 years old. I'm a neurosurgeon from Kazakhstan. Um, thank you, Professor, for such an interesting uh, presentation. It was really uh, useful and interesting, uh, I think, for everyone. Um, yeah, actually, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one question was asked about uh, lumbar drainage, but um, my second um, question is about complications. What uh, complications uh, we should pay attention to? Uh, and uh, especially what about uh, eyebrow alopecia? Um, how um, often do you have uh, such an, um, complications? Thank you. That's an interesting uh, thing. The eyebrow um, alopecia, well, that it completely goes away, I have never seen. Actually, uh, my former resident, Dr. Manovsky, published the first 250 cases of eyebrow in, um, um, incision, but that was already in 1996 or something, because we started very early with that. And except one case, all the results were good, but one had a, had a sunken bone flap and therefore was cosmetically not acceptable result. Um, there is a trick actually to avoid never shave. You don't shave the eyebrow because the hair grows not well. So don't do that, don't shave. And then you have to see how you have to make the decision a little bit oblique. So if you make it straight down, you cut through um, uh, the, the, the follicles of the hair. Uh, if you oblique it, it, it's about 20 degrees. Plastic surgeons actually told me this. They, they, they know that very well. So you learn from other specialties, from ENT, from ophthalmology, from plastic surgery, always in, in the coffee room, discuss with them. They, they have their own tricks and 20 degrees. And then it is parallel to the hairs of the, of the eyebrow. And then you, you don't have this difficulty. So you can even, I once even did it in a child of just six weeks old, and they don't have eyebrows at all. You don't even know where the eyebrow will grow later on, <laughs> but still a, a very nice uh, uh, cosmetic result. So it is possible. And uh, the general guess... complications of meningiomas, well, there are numerous. I, I think that is of course, um, like in, in all surgeries we do in skull base, I mean, you can open the frontal sinus. I tell people, if you open the frontal sinus, don't start removing the mucosa. This is something mm -hmm. I was teach to do. That's ridiculous. ENT surgeon told me you never get all the mucosa. It's impossible because of this typical going down deep there. There will always be remnants. If you have remnants in a in, 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 in frontal sinus, that means it will be a mucosal. They will be formed after some time. What you do, you fold in the uh, the mucosa that was cut or was opened. Where you do, you you push it inside, and you 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 can cover it with some fascia or something like that. The hole that you have, and try to push the bone flap. That part when you replace the bone flap close to it. That's all we do. That's all we do. And of course, sometimes we still have leakage because the dura was thin and we had tears in it. And then it, the, the water always finds a little place to go there. 
so it is not 100% secure, but that's all. Don't mess with the mucosa of the frontal sinus. That's, um, that is something we, uh, that I learned later on uh, not to do. Thank you, Professor. I see uh, Dr. Anyaku uh, raised his hand. Please, similarly, can you introduce yourself before your question? And unmute. Yes, thank you. yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Abato, for the opportunity to contribute in this presentation. My name is uh, Ikechuku Dennis Anyaku. I'm a post fellowship senior registrar at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital. Enugu, Nigeria. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Professor Yoko Kato, for all you do. And thank you, Professor Grotenay, for this uh, interesting presentation. I enjoyed every bit of it. CSF leak is a very worrisome complication of score based surgeries, especially the anterior score base. So, please, what are the the viable options you adopt to prevent or treat it in the course of the surgery, especially when you're going, when you're having this uh, below approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Yeah, this is, uh, this, this is really cumbersome. And that was the reason when I said, when I did my first skull base meningioma from below, yes. um, in the OR, I still remember a lot of people were watching and saying it was a lot of ahs and ohs and it looks beautiful. And we, we the meningioma coming out and was dissected with cottonoids and, and, and was a small meningioma, a very small meningioma as the first case. And then it took another three hours, all the attempts to close that defect. There were no R's and O's, and the visitors left the OR because, oh my goodness, this takes time. This is, oh my goodness. And yes, so we, we, we managed. We, I tried to get everything in what I had, what we helped, had on the shelf, but it was extremely difficult. I haven't, had not given that proper choices, uh, proper thoughts before uh, that first case. I thought, well, we, it's the meningioma we have to get. And then, Drilling that skull base was also not difficult, but the reconstruction was a nightmare. And yes, that lady had a leak afterwards. So we had to go back in again, but she leaked again. So then we did it from above and we had to take fascia lata from her leg. And that was a lady that when I said, we can do it super operatively or through the nose, she said, oh, through the nose, I don't have a scar, oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. At the end, she had a scar here, Tyrional, to close it from above. She had a, sc a scar on the leg from the fascia lata. I can tell you, I am not her favorite doctor. The meningioma was gone. Yes, absolutely. So I learned it the hard way. And then around 1999, I stopped doing it. I said, this is just terrible. I can do it properly from above. And from below, I can't deal with these, those leaks. It was not 40%, it was 80%. Well, rarely we had somebody that didn't leak. Oh, wow, that was very special. I remember the craniofrangioma case that didn't leak. Wow, that was a wonder. So when the nasal septal flap came back, yes, it reduced, but still, still we have leaks. So we still don't have proper techniques in the resurgery to deal with a skull-based defect from below. That's the point. We can make big defects, no, no, no issue. We can drill even the whole clivus. We can drill the petrous bone even. We can go to the CP angle. And then we are left with big holes and having then the CSF coming out there. And of course, we, we destroy the nasal anatomy. We, uh, we, we take the, the turbinates. They, uh, they have this empty nose effect. They, um, they, they feel that they can't breathe but it, it, because it cannot circulate properly. We do that all and then claim that it is minimally invasive. Now, we should not call endoscopic skull-based surgery minimally invasive or not traumatic. It's very traumatic. 
And as you say, the, the, the CSF leaks is still an unsolved. We have reduced it. We can do it. But we pack that nose. I mean, I usually close the whole sphenoid sinus. And yes, it had some mucosils and it had some infections in, in the nose. And they have this, the patient, would, we think of, not about that as neurosurgeons, but they have these post-nasal drip constantly when they lay down. Uh, the, the, the slime is going down back from the, the sinuses. So we, we add some morbidity to, uh, to that, nasal morbidity to it. Um, and that's um, and it's easy then to say, oh, my ENT colleague is taking care of that, but um, we are doing it. So no, that's an unsolved problem. And from above, yes, we sometimes have, but it's much less, of course. From above, we as neurosurgeons are rather well equipped in dealing with leaks. We can do. Thank you very much, and you. we also have. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mayank. Yes, uh, I'm here. Yes. A short yes. introduction uh, good evening, for your question. Yes. Yes. So, uh, good evening. I'm Dr. Mayank. I'm from uh, India. I'm a young neurosurgeon practicing there. And uh, currently, I'm doing my fellowship with Professor Yoko Kato. So, uh, as uh, Professor, everyone has uh, said that it's a wonderful presentation. And you shared uh, very good tips, such as putting tissue glue on the uh, exposed nerve. So I would like to know some other tips uh, for how you manage these very fibrous and calcified uh, meningiomas, uh, as you said, which is uh, hypo intense on uh, T2. So any tips uh, on how to manage these? The most important tip is um, uh, patience. It's extremely time consuming. And these meningiomas, I don't have specific trip, uh, tricks in it, don't waste your micro instruments on it because they you break your micro scissors on them. So um, I learned with the monopolar loops to score out. It's, it smells terrible. It's, it's, it's very tough to do, but it's, it's difficult. If it is a kind of thick rubber ball, you some somehow have to uh, decompress it. And even if you have decompressed it, those capsules are rarely really falling in. You, you start to dissect around and place the cotinoids more and more and more. But in these, it, it's, it's much more time consuming. And that's the only way. It's arduous, it takes time and can take forever. But that's, that's the point. It is. Um, um, and, and watch out, they, they are very often more firmly attached to structures. So they tend to be not so, if it is small there, then of course it is not, not, not so difficult, but the, the large fibrous tumors, they are extremely difficult. That really takes forever, but it's, it's by bit and bit and bit and bit and bit. And then just do that. The QSA usually doesn't do anything in those, the really big fibrous lesions. And then it means scissors, knives, um, um, what you can have. And um, it's, um, it's, it's hard. I, I don't have specific tricks. I, I try the instruments that, that are available, but I learned not to... Um, uh, I destroyed my diamond knife on it. I destroyed my, my nice set of micro scissors on it. Um, and it doesn't work. Uh, for the fibrous ones, you need the, the, the big ones, the Metzenbaum scissors, the, uh, the, 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 the real knives, the, the scalpels. And it's, um, it's not easy. <laughs> I don't have any trick, but don't lose your patience. So if you have such a case, don't schedule three other surgeries afterwards. That simply will not, it will take the rest of your day. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saita, please unmute, unmute. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, osteoma uh, associated to uh, meningiomas. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, as we know, in uh, some cases, uh, the, uh, some uh, osteomas uh, are uh, pathologic in the, uh, at the base with the uh, uh, meningeal tumor. And in some cases, we uh, open the, uh, the, the ethmoidal cell uh, uh, or uh, uh, it was spenoid as a uh, uh, sinus. Uh, I want to know how you deal with uh, the osteo uh, this uh, this uh, osteomas. I mean, when the when when you drill and you see that that uh, there is a meningioma inside the uh, the, the the osteoma. I'm not sure that I understand it. So you mean you an osteoma and inside is a meningioma? Uh, doc, yes, there is. Uh, uh, in my I experience, have a meningioma in my... with, with bony parts in it. Yeah, yes. Especially at the school very Jesus. Yeah. But I call that hyperostosis. Yes, uh, yes, uh, hyperostosis. Uh, yes, yes. But in some cases, cases uh, there is two, uh, when we drill, but normal bone, we found tumor, uh, tumoral. Uh, the, Absolutely. The, yeah. Yes. We sometimes think that it looks like normal bone, but if the pathologist looked at it, there is still a meningioma in it. Yes. That makes it also so difficult to, to say I have a, a Simpson grade one a removal from a skull based meningioma. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm not so afraid of drilling the skull base or the epmoid bone and then falling into the sinus. So it, it just means that you have to recognize that and then do a reconstruction of the skull base. If I do it from above, uh, I have that's that's not a big deal. So I would uh, I would drill orbital roofs. I will drill the the cribriform plate. I will drill the whole tuberculum. Even if I end up in the sphenoid sinus, I drill as much as possible if there are if there are bony um, bony parts of it. And drill is is, uh, is the best way to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I do it uh, in general like by lateral approach, bacterial approach, and when we uh, open the sphenoid for uh, uh, a meningioma with extension in the sphenoid, I put cement uh, uh, in the sinus. I cement? Yes. You mean acrylic? Yes, acrylic. But we have. I have no complication. Uh, Okay, uh, with that. Because I, 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 I have a combination some, uh, of cases. acrylic with, with, uh, with mucosa. Mm. That combination is, is not, not ideal. I, so I, would, I avoid uh, cement in, in, mm. in that. I have seen a, a case where um, the focus uh, I, was completely filled up with cement in order mm. to prevent a CSF leak, but, but it ended up with, with a terrible osteomyelitis. So I, mm. I would not do that. No. I, I, I do. Excuse me. I, I do cement for uh, for vertebral plasty. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yes. that's that's very common. Uh, yes. that's right. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I think, uh, uh, Sachin, maybe should we move on because uh, uh, we have other two lectures. What do you think? Yes, uh, I agree, Doctor Alberto. In fact, even Doctor Professor Andre had requested me that he wanted to. Uh, leave. Uh, yeah, he yeah. has another yeah. meeting after yes. this. Right. Very yes. Ah. And I have half an hour, so it is very close. Um, close call. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I, I we'll take that last question since Dragon has raised the hand, and after that we'll uh, we'll conclude. So Dragon, please quickly ask a question. Uh, just a quick question about timing the surgery after embolization. Direct uh, after embolization, the same day, and uh, or in twenty four hours. No, you cannot. You can do that uh, within t seventy-two hours. I would not do it immediately after that, um, because it always gives a reaction, and it depends a little bit on the amount of, uh, of um, embolization that you use. But um, um, I would schedule it between twenty-four and seventy-two hours afterwards. If you wait, for example, a month, then um, it's. Uh, it, it, you still have some room, but after months, you know that there will be some revascularizations already going on. So you should not do that. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dragon. And thank you very much, Professor Andre Grotenius. I'm so sorry I holded you a little longer because of the because of the questions and enthusiasm of young neurosurgeon. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, okay. You're yes. welcome. Bye -bye. So let's bye bye. Thank you very much. So let's move on uh, with our next uh, presentation. And I would request uh, Dr. Manu Chair uh, Davlatov from Tajikistan to please kindly uh, uh, introduce short introduction of Professor Tata Shivatanabe. Dr. Manu Chair, are you there? Dr. Manu Chair? Okay, then uh, I think I will introduce him on behalf of him. So, uh, Professor Tadashi Watanabe is a professor of neurosurgery at Aichi Medical University Hospital, Japan, and his areas of interest is minimally invasive neurosurgery, endoscopic and exoscopic neurosurgery, and skull-based surgery. And he's going to talk on endoscopic keyhole approaches, the current status of uh, our practice. So over to you, Professor Tadashi Watanabe. Okay, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me and giving me a chance to talk here. And I'm going to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet, just a moment. Maybe it's just rolling. Double click to enter full screen mode. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, we can see it now. Perfect. You can uh, do the, yes slide share okay uh, uh, good evening and good good uh, hello everyone and uh, so today uh, I'm going to uh, share my experience of uh, endoscopic keyhole approach and the uh, current status of our practice okay so I'm going to uh, summarize up uh, shortly uh, within 30 minutes maybe and uh, this schema is the concept of my uh, approach uh, from a small. Oh, can you can you hear me? Okay. Uh, from small entrance uh, with a minimum brain retraction, uh, with a wide surgical view of an endoscope, we can look around the corner, and we do this approach especially for uh, extra axial tumor like a meningioma and craniopharyngioma uh, sometimes and uh, like sometimes pituitary adenoma with a minimum wound. And my first experience of the endoscopic keyhole approach is in 2006 in uh, Pittsburgh. The, I witnessed the Professor Joe, Professor Handon Joe's uh, surgery. At that time, he was challenging to a uh, keyhole endoscopic approach. And I was really impressed about uh, the really wide viewing angle of endoscope. Uh, he had done uh, MVD with this uh, approach and also eyebrow approach he had done. And immediately coming back to Japan, I started by myself. Uh, this, may, this may be the first case for me. And I began with a very simple case like this, uh, uh, the small meningioma at the planum sphenoidale. And uh, with a uh, uh, normal uh, instrument uh, like a bipolar and uh, suction, and we could achieve the complete resection. So, uh, I could uh, observe the beyond the uh, uh, bony uh, protrusion, and uh, we could observe the optic nerve clearly. So initial experience was uh, 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 simple tumors like this. And also I began uh, endoscopic MVD, and I realized uh, a quite a different viewing angle between microscope and endoscope. Endoscope has a really much wider uh, viewing angle, and uh, I can we can uh, confirm the anatomy and the responsible vessels clearly. And uh, I show you some complicated case. Uh, 
uh, I experienced in 2013. And this patient, 51 years old women, uh, already underwent many surgeries, uh, including anterotemporal approach, a frontotemporal approach, and anteropetrosal approach, and uh, lateral suboxital approach. But uh, uh, she, uh, the recurrence happened again and again, and uh, surgery was repeated. So uh, one of the surgery was done by a very famous Japanese neurosurgeon. Even though uh, uh, the the tumor was uh, partially removed, but uh, uh, soon soon after the surgery, the tumor regrows. And uh, at that time, the uh, cranial nerve, third, fourth, seventh, eighth, was a completely par paralysis. And, uh, and also the hemiparesis was de uh, deteriorating at that time. So because of maybe the pushing of a, a cerebral peduncle of the right side. So in this case, uh, we have done uh, endoscopic anterior petrosal approach. By uh, drawing uh, a Petra tip, we could observe uh, th this kind of viewing angle, but uh, uh, at the corner, it is difficult to observe by microscope. So we use an endoscope for upper side and uh, uh, below, upper and below. And this is the video. And already the corridor was uh, created with a previous surgery and uh, I directly approached to the lesion. And now uh, I'm uh, dissecting the uh, tumor. Uh, especially the tumor membrane hardly attaching to the midbrain. Uh, maybe this image is uh, uh, by a 30 degree endoscope. So at that time, I didn't have uh, uh, much uh, specialized instruments. So I used a flexible second and a flexible silver dissector. I'm so uh, 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 the, okay recurrence happened again and again was uh, there was a thick membrane uh, attaching uh, on the uh, brain stem surface. So now I change the direction of the endoscope and uh, continue the, the section of the membrane. And uh, I'm removing the tumor as much as possible. Actually, in this part, uh, the small vessels are, uh, are running from a tip of a basal artery. So we have to, all we have to do is just preserve the, all the, every single uh, arteries. And then we change to the direction to uh, uh, below and uh, in front of the uh, medulla. The oldest started a resuscitation, but uh, as you know, it soon recovered. And uh, we continued uh, removing the tumor. So mostly, mostly the tumor was uh, removed, uh, except the uh, hardly attaching uh, membrane at, on the uh, vessels. So uh, this is the post Uh, uh, mostly the tumor was. Here I show you the, another another manager on right side. And uh, first we did an extra dura approach to decrease the feeder, feeding arteries, uh, control the feeding arteries, and then we go into the interdural space. And uh, now I'm uh, 
uh, here is the right optic nerve compressed medially by the tumor. And uh, uh, so now uh, you can see the third nerve here. So as you see, the, uh, by the wide viewing angle, uh, we can uh, observe the uh, surgical field widely, uh, even from a small entrance. So, and uh, finally, uh, so the tumor hardly attaching to the optic nerve was shaved. Uh, and uh, as you see, the when we uh, get close, the uh, get closer, we can see the uh, He noticed that uh, uh, the keyhole uh, uh, size uh, 2.5 to 3 or 3 or 4 centimeters is the best size because uh, brain retraction is limited. Instruments are stabilized on the, the edge of the cranial to mini rim, so we can do a stable manipulation and a sufficient place, a space for uh, manipulation. If the keyhole is smaller than two centimeters, uh, always the manipulation is very difficult. So 2.53, four uh, is the best size for, for uh, uh, this approach. And uh, uh, actually I would like to, you to realize the, the skull bone uh, is created by, by God to protect the brain. So uh, uh, always a minimum uh, keyhole is the best, I believe. Okay, I show you another case. Uh, this is the middle for meningioma. And uh, if we do this uh, tumor surgery uh, with a microscope, I may uh, remove the uh, zygomatic arch. Uh, diagnostic uh, osteotomy will be added. But uh, uh, using an endoscope, we make a, a keyhole just beside the tumor, and then uh, we can observe the tumor attachment from inside. So uh, using this technique, you, we don't need to do a diagnostic osteotomy. So with a small keyhole, we could remove the uh, tumor, including uh, uh, attachment. And uh, this is the case of metastatic tumor. Uh, and the tumors uh, is uh, the shallow west point uh, uh, to the surface is the falcus, falcus side. So, uh, and also the tumor is uh, existing in uh, uh, the motor strip. So, uh, in this case, we did a uh, uh, you know, uh, interhemispheric. We use the interhemispheric space. Actually, this space is uh, totally free, and there is no breaching structure uh, between uh, brain and the fox. So, using a thirty-degree endoscope, we can observe the surface of the tumor, the uh, surface of the brain, and uh, which is a sh shallowest point. And then we could remove the tumor uh, simply. And uh, I show you this is the uh, breaching vein. So uh, actually the craniotomy is made a, a little bit frontal side uh, from the tumor. So just above the tumor, there is uh, uh, this kind of breaching vein. So it, it looks uh, very hard uh, and complicated to if we do a dissection of this part. Okay. And uh, this, uh, I show you the uh, movement of the scalpist uh, during the surgery. As you see, the uh, uh, recently I uh, mostly I do a scalpist, and my colleague Dr. Iwami does the surgery. He's a really skilled scalpist surgeon, and I am supporting him. And using a two hand, uh, I do a, a meticulous control of uh, endoscope. Uh, I'm always using uh, the pneumatic for standing holder. 
and uh, move uh, the endoscope as we need. And uh, always I am touching on the shaft of the endoscope uh, to, to, uh, to do a really meticulous movement. And also uh, I avoid the confliction of the tools with the endoscope. So I serve the really comfortable surgical field for a surgeon. Actually, I know uh, where is the right place to uh, uh, set the endoscope uh, for a comfortable surgery. So I always moving uh, the endoscope. So uh, when we do lateral part of the surgical feed, I put the endoscope at uh, six o'clock side and uh, uh, now the surgeon was bending the tip of the uh, uh, bipolar and uh, finished the surgery. And, uh, and uh, actually exoscope uh, changed our strategy. Uh, in this uh, three, four years, I, we are using exoscope. The, the upper one is a 2D exoscope, the first generation, and this is a, a 3D bitome ex, uh, exoscope from Stoltz. And uh, this is the uh, OVI Olympus uh, made in Japan. And we use this uh, recently. And uh, <clears throat> uh, when we use an exoscope, uh, the surgery style is uh, similar as an uh, endoscope because uh, there's a monitor in front of us. So it is so-called head-up surgery. So uh, it may be simple uh, to switch from exoscope to endoscope. So nothing will cha change around the patient. And there's a the monitor patient and uh, a holder. Uh, we just uh, changed the scope. And actually, last year we uh, have uh, uh, complete. Uh, we have uh, published uh, this uh, paper, uh, combined endoscopic and endoscopic two-step keyhole approach for intracranial meningioma. In this series, uh, actually, we could uh, show a significantly better outcome uh, in this exo and endoscopic approach. Uh, by means of uh, blood loss, uh, hospital stay, and you know, surgical time, and craniotomy size. Uh, actually, it is a historical comparison, but uh, we could uh, uh, show the uh, significant uh, better data. In this case, uh, parasitic meningioma, uh, parasitic meningioma, uh, actually, there's a diploic vein uh, which may uh, functioning of the drainage of the brain blood flow. And there is also the bridging vein. So uh, we better avoid this area. So we made a, a plan of me at the front side and uh, we look around the corner from the front side. At the first uh, stage of the surgery, we use the exoscope. Uh, we do a dissection of the compression of a tumor as much as possible with the exoscope. And then we change to the endoscope. And then we uh, reach to the attachment of the tumor. And finally, we uh, remove all the tumor uh, except uh, on the sagittal sinus. I co we co coagulated this part. And this is a very old patient. Uh, with a C1 meningioma and the ventral side meningioma. And uh, in this case, also, we uh, uh, did a surgery with a minimum skin incision and uh, hemilaminectomy C1. And first, we have done uh, the compression with the exoscope. And then we change to the endoscope and I look around the corner beyond the uh, spinal cord. And totally, the tumor was resected. And this is a case of uh, Peter Kriver meningioma. And uh, we have done a retro sigmoid approach. And first, we did a detachment, decompression of the tumor. And then we changed the endoscope and looking up 
uh, especially the the upper side uh, in ambient cistern uh, we could observe the third knob the pc and the fourth knob everything we could uh, observe clearly and we could preserve the order structure and we could remove the uh, all the tumor uh, except the tumor in the uh, meco cave and this is also the old patient and uh, he developed a gait disturbance and uh, the symptom was developing quickly. So we did the surgery, but uh, because he is old, old, our strategy is the maximum decompression of the tumor. Actually, we left a small layer of the tumor on the surface of the brainstem. So anyway, uh, so we uh, change to, uh, first we use the exoscope and change to the endoscope and beyond the uh, uh, vein, uh, uh, petrozo vein, we could also be on the vein, the precise, and we left some amount of uh, tumor, and we could observe uh, the every uh, anatomical structure and finish the surgery. Okay, show you this is the uh, anterior petrosa approach for a uh, CP angle epidermoid cyst. And we have done uh, about a three by four centimeter craniotomy at the tempora. And we have done anterior petrosectomy uh, with an exoscope. And uh, we have be began the, uh, the compression of the tumor with an exoscope as much as possible. But the tumor is uh, uh, extending widely in, in a posterior fossa. So we, we change the uh, endoscope and we look around the corner and uh, we could observe everything. And uh, in this case, the tumor is uh, extending beyond the uh, ambient cistern uh, on the back, back side of the middle uh, 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 midbrain. And uh, uh, so now, we are removing the tumor beyond the tiny uh, vessels. So preserving uh, this kind of reaching tiny vessels, we remove the tumor as much as possible. This is a fifth nerve, and uh, we are removing tumor around the fifth nerve. So uh, we could achieve the uh, maximum resection with the tumor without any complication. And uh, this is the last case and uh, <clears throat> the MVD for facial spasm on the left side, the vessel is uh, compressing the root exit zone here. So uh, as a uh, other case, uh, as the same as other case, we use the exoscope first. Uh, uh, and uh, now first we do a CSF drainage first and uh, make uh, some space and uh, do a arachnoid dissection first. And uh, after the dissection, some amount of arachnoid dissection and uh, confirm the seventh or eighth node, we, we change to the endoscope. And uh, actually MVD is a, a, a bloodless surgery. So uh, in this, uh, M in MVD surgery, we use a wet field surgery. I mean, uh, surgery under water. So now this is left side. Uh, so this is lower cranial of ninth and tenth, and uh, this is the uh, vein. Uh, and the uh, responsible vessel is here beyond the vein, and there's two uh, arteries. And uh, here beyond the flocculus is a. Uh, 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 root exit zone of eight, uh, seventh nerve. Now you can see the uh, two, uh, two, two roofs uh, of artery. So now uh, the compression was achieved and uh, uh, AMR disappeared at this moment. So we uh, always do a, a wet field surgery for MVD surgery. 
And uh, uh, if I, we can uh, do a transposition, we try uh, uh, transposition, but in this kind of uh, complicated cases, we do an interposition and we uh, change the place of the two loops and fix the prosthesis uh, with a glue and we finish the surgery. Okay, here is my summary uh, endoscopic keyhole approach with uh, actually an exoscopic approach. Uh, use of endoscope reduce the surgical invasiveness and they use the appropriate scope where needed. We can change uh, anywhere, anytime we want. And the uh, advantages of two scopes compensate for the disadvantage each other and optimize the minimally invasive neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tadashi Watanabe. I actually had the opportunity to see your surgeries in person, so yeah. I can understand and <laughs> uh, your yeah. points more clearly. But um, yeah. I would hand over to uh, Dr. Alberto, who is the chairperson for today's session, to make comments about Professor Tadashi Watanabe's uh, presentation. Thank you, Sachin. Well, it is... Uh... It is a pleasure to uh, give some comments uh, to Professor Watanabe's uh, presentation. I also had the opportunity to uh, visit his uh, center a few years ago and to assist and observe uh, uh, his surgeries. He is a really, really uh, skilled endoscopic surgeon. Uh, there is a danger in looking at his presentations. Uh, uh, seeing that it is so, it seems so easy to deal with so many <laughs> pathologies just with an endoscope, uh, which is uh, uh, what Sensei something uh, you should disclose at the beginning of your presentations because uh, we must say that uh, there is a learning curve uh, to be able to do such wonderful endoscopic surgeries. Uh, however, I think uh, this should be an inspiration to young neurosurgeons to uh, start developing their skills with an endoscope. Because as we could see from your presentation, uh, it is really possible to uh, have a clear vision uh, in any corner inside the, the, the skull. Even those uh, blind areas for a microsurgery. So thank you very much for this uh, really wonderful uh, uh, overlook on what it is possible to do with an endoscope. And I think uh, uh, we should uh, uh, start the discussion with our discussants, uh, Sachin, if you, if you agree. Yeah. Uh, I would like uh, to ask, uh, uh, as before, Professor uh, Arion Musabeliu to uh, give his uh, comment on this presentation. Thanks, uh, mille grazie Alberto. And uh, Watanabe Sensei, thank you so very much for um, introducing um, um, work from your experience. It's a beautiful, simple, and um, and elegant. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask, and maybe with that uh, question, uh, if uh, if possible, take a lead from uh, the comment that Alberto made. What was your learning curve uh, following that uh, that fellowship or uh, training uh, period that you had at Pittsburgh? Uh, you mentioned that uh, it was then that your uh, your work started. Um, endoscopy, at least in my hands, hasn't been easy without practice, just like every other surgical uh, techniques we use to uh, to it for the tools available we have at hand. So would you please um, um, tell us uh, what, uh, how was your training curve and when you felt yourself uh, confident into approaching those cases mm -hmm. that you presented us today? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, there is a, learning curve of course uh we have to use to use it uh, so the point is uh 
I, I, I always say to the young, use endoscope anytime you want and uh, prepare the endoscope always beside the surgical uh, field. And, uh, and experience uh, more and more endoscopic surgery, including uh, ICH surgery, hematoma surgery, we do uh, with a transparent cylinder. And uh, of course we do uh, endonasal surgery. And uh, so uh, the strategy is different, but uh, endoscopic surgery is similar. So there always be an endoscope itself at the surgical field. So there must be a confliction between endoscope and the uh, tools. That is the the the, uh, the one of the most difference between endoscopic surgery and microsurgery. So we have to use to it. So after some experience, uh, uh, you can know how to do it, uh, where to place the endoscope and uh, uh, what kind of tools we should use. Uh, uh, maybe you can aware uh, little by little after some experience. So my advice is uh, a challenge uh, to try to use endoscope anytime you want. So just put put the endoscope inside a, a surgical field. That's okay. And uh, use the uh, one hand surgery a little bit. That is uh, okay. So that may be, uh, it can be uh, some training. So uh, after some experience, you can do a surgery. Okay. Thank you, Professor Watanabe. And we also have Dilshod. Maybe he is online now. Are you here, Dilshod? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so yes. much. Great. So, Dilshod, maybe you want to give uh, us your comment about uh, Professor Watanabe's talk. Uh, yes. Thank you, Watanabe Sensei, for your excellent presentation. Uh, it was a Real pleasure to listen to your uh, talk. And actually, as uh, Alberto and uh, Sachin said, I was also uh, had an experience with uh, endoscopic mm, endonasal surgery uh, in your department. Also, when I was in uh, when I was in a fellowship in uh, with Professor Kato, um, and uh, they are fascinating always. Uh, when I see the uh, suturing the dura after endonasal endonasal approach, uh, it was seem, it seems like impossible. But after seeing this, I thought it is quite possible, and it is really minimally invasive surgery, um, and it is also it is always inspiration uh, for us to use how 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 you use the endoscope in dealing with the cases you showed us. And I just wanted to ask about the uh, endoscopic arm, uh, fixed uh, position of endoscope. Uh, when you don't have this uh, endoscopic arm, uh, do you uh, able to use uh, manually uh, just holding the endoscope uh, just like the fixed uh, endo arm, or it is uh, always mandatory to use the endo arm, as we don't have the endo arm in our uh, institution. We use only holding the manual lead. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the good question. And actually, in Japan, the two types of uh, floor standing uh, endoscopic holder is available. So. I prefer to use it, but actually, uh, even in Japan, uh, some surgeons don't use the holder. Uh, uh, they, uh, li like uh, I showed you, the scopist is holding a scope and the surgeon do the surgery. So uh, you can do without a holder. So I, I sometimes do that uh, with the other hospital. I go out to uh, do a surgery on the other hospital. I sometimes do like that. So uh, uh, without a uh, holder, you can do it. Yeah, even uh, uh, keyhole surgery. Actually, uh, Professor Goto in Osaka, uh, he is doing a, uh, endoscopic keyhole surgery uh, with a two, two neurosurgeons. One neurosurgeon is holding a, 
uh, scope without uh, a flower standing holder. So uh, I think uh, it is, of course, uh, possible. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe you can anywhere. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. That was a, uh, some kind of a tricky question. If we are going to invite you to our institution, so you are going to work <laughs> with the uh, assistants, yes. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. So, Dilja, we can you. do that, definitely. Uh, I see we have a raised hand, uh, uh, Dr. Mayank. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, even I had the opportunity to uh, witness uh, Professor Watanabe perform surgery and it was a large tumor and he skeletonized the uh, basilar trunk and we got a very good view of the anatomy. So uh, my question is uh, how a uh, professor, uh, like uh, for young neurosurgeons, if there is an inadvertent uh, injury to any major vessel, so uh, how do you handle such a uh, uh, complication? Any tips and any guidance on that? Yes. Uh... Actually, uh, I have one case of uh, uh, arterial bleeding uh, during the surgery, uh, during the very complicated in, in, invasive scalpus meningioma uh, involving the IC. So, uh, but the management of arterial bleeding is uh, exactly the same as the microscope. You know, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the scopist is uh, uh, very important at the, such a time. So uh, scopist have to clean up the tip of the lens uh, always and uh, uh, put put the endoscope in the right place and uh, uh, and uh, show the sur surgeon a uh, very good view. And, and uh, what to do is the same as the microsurgery. Just suck the point suction, suck the bleeding point and put the surgery cell and glue or something. Uh, same thing, we can manage. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there other uh, questions? Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Anyaku, who is also moderator, uh, Professor Wozniak or uh, Dragan. Uh, Dr. Filetti, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Professor Muzorbele outrunned me with my questions. With my questions, so I have another one. Uh, Professor Watanabe, thank you very much. Uh, as always, uh, great presentation, very impressive. Uh, you're very, very, very skillful. Uh, my question is, uh, as you have a unique experience with the micro, endo, and exo, so can you uh, outline some borders, some limitations for each of these methods for you? This is my question. Okay, limitation. Uh, you know, exoscope is uh, quite similar as a microscope, uh, but uh, it is uh, the camera head is much smaller and the uh, visual axis is much more free uh, uh, than microscope. And but uh, uh, because the eye eye of the camera itself is outside of the surgical field, it's same same as microscope. You cannot see the blind corner uh, beyond the uh, protruding bone or structure. So that is the limit of the exoscope microscope and uh, endoscope. We can look. Uh, yeah, using a, a angle of the scope, we can look uh, look at nineteen degree uh, side side of the uh, surgical field. But uh, uh, I think it is a, a good expression or not a, a limit limitation. It's not a limitation, but the disadvantage of endoscopic surgery is the uh, uh, confliction of uh, tools and endoscope. And uh, we cannot see the uh, backside of the lens of the endoscope. Like uh, uh, inside a surgical field and backside of the lens of the endoscope, that is a blind corner. This is a paradoxical, but uh, there is a blind area in even in an endoscopic surgery. So we ha have to watch out. 
uh, uh, for example, if there is a bridging, very thick bridging vein, we have to care. Once we uh, go through the bridging vein and the vein is outside the uh, visual uh, surgical field, it's going to be a, a little bit dangerous. So we have to watch out. That is a disadvantage of endoscope. So uh, we use uh, two scopes uh, uh, pro appropriately. So we change uh, anytime we want. So that is my point. I okay. see. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I see maybe if uh, uh, Dr. Pirzad is uh, online, maybe he wants to give a comment on this presentation. Hello. Uh, Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Badnabi. Uh, it was great. And it, it was uh, uh, excellent lecture and presentation. And it, uh, it's, I, I, I think, as you told that it's uh, available everywhere. And, uh, but uh, in the countries like Afghanistan and with limited resources, it exists. Scope is a, a good uh, uh, choice and opinion. Uh, thank you, yes. and uh, we will uh, communicate with you for uh, uh, to uh, show us maybe some uh, lectures or webinars for uh, our young neurosurgeons how to uh, deal with uh, exoscope as well, and uh, uh, for our availability. Uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor Sachin. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you, Doctor. Thank so, you, Dr. Ahmed. As you rightly said, exoscope can be a good alternative for uh, microscope, and it is cheap also as compared to very expensive microscope. So uh, it's not a bad idea to for the, some young neurosurgeon to directly start training with the exoscope. Uh, yes. Maybe in the future, exoscope will replace uh, many surgeries, uh, although microscope will continue to be there as a mainstream, but exoscope will replace for many surgeries. So if uh, no other uh, questions or comment from anybody, let's move on to our next uh, presentation, the young neurosurgeon presentation. Uh, yes, uh, Sharik Bey, you want to ask some question? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a um, few questions. First of all, um, thank you, Professor Watanabe, for your uh, very interesting um, presentation um i just uh, wanted to know uh, do you use an uh, exoscope during your uh, bony stage for example for anterior petrosectomy uh, that because you showed a few cases about uh, where uh, where you do uh, petrosectomy and um, also um, did you have uh, experience of um maybe bypass uh, bypass surgery um, with using the exoscope thank you okay thank you for the question uh so uh your question is uh, uh so when we do an anteropetrosal approach uh, so uh i use the exoscope now I used to use the endoscope when I drilled a, a petrous strip of the uh, petrous strip, uh, but actually the view uh, is a little bit different uh, between endoscope and exoscope, uh, especially when we d drill drill the bone. You know, maybe because of the viewing angle. So. Uh, Especially for the anteropetrosal approach, and the, uh, the shadow of the bone is a little bit important when we recognize where to drill. So I now I prefer uh, drilling with exoscope. Endoscope we can, but the uh, exoscope is more comfortable uh, to do a, a bony drilling. And after making a corridor, we change to the endoscope. And uh, also uh, about uh, uh, anastomosis, uh, of course, we have experience of anastomosis. So uh, using uh, OBI, Olympus Japanese one, is has a good quality of uh, 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 images. So we can do uh, anastomosis of uh, uh, tiny vessels. It, it is possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so very much, Sarik Bhai. So let's move on with our last uh, and the next uh, presentation that is Young Neurosurgeon presentation. So I would request uh, the next moderator uh, from uh, Nigeria, Dr. Ikechiku Aniaku, to kindly introduce Dr. Nicolo, and then Nicolo can share his screen and start presentation after that. Dr. Ikechiku. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sachin. It's a uh, great pleasure that I introduce our young neurosurgeon speaker, Dr. Nicolo Matias Matiasene. He had his residency training in neurosurgery at the University of Verona, Italy. And presently, he's uh, a neurosurgeon practicing at the Department of Neurosurgery, Bungu Rento University Hospital, Verona, Italy. He's also a research fellow in neurosurgery at the Department of Neurosciences, Biomedicine, and Movement Sciences at the Section of Neurosurgery, University of Verona, Italy. He's a member of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies, where he's a member of the Global and Humanitarian uh, Neurosurgery Committee. Today, he will anchor a presentation on the spinal spinal trauma management in low and medium income countries. A survey on, on global scale and bootstrap concepts. Dr. Nicolo, we are glad to have you and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. I will start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Nicolo, yes, please go yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for uh, the presentation and for giving me the opportunity to, to present our project to this prestigious webinar with such uh, global outreach. With, this, uh, with this, this presentation, we show some aspect of a project we are currently conducting with the aim to give a contribute to improve some aspects of the care of spinal trauma patients in some uh, regions of the world with uh, limited resources. To begin and to help to, to give a general view of the entire project, I would like to show a simple clinical case that could be the everyday practice in many, in many regions of the world. Let's, let's imagine to be in a remote area uh, where in the middle of the night, a car accident occurs, and the young man is found with difficulties in moving his legs. The man is transferred some hours after trauma uh, by car to the closest emergency rooms, where he is found with an incomplete neurological deficit. A spinal X-ray is taken some hours after trauma, and a T11 bus fracture is found. I, I guess that most of the people here would uh, agree with the optimal management of this case, that is to take as soon as possible a CT and an MRI, to ask for neurosurgical consultation, and to perform a decompression as soon as possible within 24 hours and eventually an arthrodesis and to transfer the patient in the ICU for post-operative care. However, the reality in this specific case is quite different. Indeed, in this emergency room, there is CT scan only available in very select cases, and patients have to pay their CT scan. There is not an MRI. There is not a neurosurgeon, but only a general surgeon, and there is not an ICU. So uh, what to do then? What is the best possible option of treatment for this, uh, for this patient with this specific set of uh, resources available? This was just a very simple example to give a general view of the aims of our scope. Uh, but that could be the everyday scenario in many regions of the world. Indeed, as you surely know, Around 80% of the global burden of spinal traumas occur in low and middle income countries. 
and around 800,000 new spinal injuries occur every year in these regions of the world. However big disparities exist between high-income countries and low-middle-income countries in the distribution of the neurosurgical workforce and other health-related resources with obvious disadvantage for low-middle-income countries. And these differences may affect the way the patient with spinal trauma are treated. In uh, such different realities, guidelines may be seen as a lighthouse. Indeed, as they represent the best of the evidence-based medicine, they should guide universally clinicians in taking the best decision for their patients. However, some recommendations like guidelines may require directly or indirectly tools and resources that may be absent or at least inadequate in some, uh, in some regions of the world. This could ultimately affect patient outcomes. In very brief, what we are overall trying to do uh, with this entire project is to build a set of protocols that are resource specific and that go beyond the strict framework of the currently existing guidelines that are strictly based on the evidences, but they don't always take into account real scenarios. Uh, in the first step, we tried to build some evidence of these disparities existing between high-income countries and low-income countries. And for this scope, we conducted a survey addressed to physicians managing spinal traumas in low-income countries. In a second phase, we started developing resource-specific protocols of management for spinal trauma. And about to these two steps, I will briefly talk today. In the future, we hope to test such protocols and algorithms of management in real environments. So about the first step, uh, we, we conducted a survey um, around two years ago addressed to physicians managing spinal trauma in low and middle income countries. The questions of the survey were specifically designed to explore the capability to follow some of the recommendations of the last uh, uh, of the WFNS guidelines. Overall, we obtained a high number of responses. Indeed, we got more than 1,000 answers from uh, 79 low and middle income countries. Most answers came from uh, middle income countries, both from orthopedics and neurosurgeons. And here I will show some of the results of the survey that help to understand the differences between the different regions in the applicability of some of the guidelines. Uh, for example, according to the last WFNS guidelines, patients at high risk of spinal cord injury should be immobilized by a heart cervical collar and a spinal backboard for transportation. In the old sample, around 50% would re regularly receive such patients with a heart cervical collar and less than half on a spinal backboard. And stratifying the result as per uh, income region, in red there is low income countries, in yellow lower middle income countries, and green upper middle income countries, there are significant differences in the use of such uh, instruments. And such differences goes parallel to the availability of a professional pre-hospital system. Transfer for spinal cord injury. According to the last WFNS guidelines, patients with spinal cord injury should be transferred as soon as possible to the definitive center of care within 24 hours from injury. Uh, in the first column of this graph can be seen the answers from the old sample. And it indeed seems that around 80% would be able to receive spinal cord injuries within 24 hours. However, stratifying the results as per economic area, the differences become clear. For example, in low income countries, around 60% would receive spinal cord injuries 24 hours after trauma and one third, 48 hours of the trauma. Differences were also found as per geographic area. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 40% would receive spinal cord injuries 24 hours after trauma. 
And the most virtuous region was Middle East and Northern Africa. Among the explored factors, one could be the availability of air transportation, and that was not available for 72% respondents or 92% respondents for low income countries. About the medical management of spinal cord injury, the last WFNS guidelines uh, recommend a set of cardiopulmonary parameters that can be maintained only in an ICU or in an HDU. And indeed, around 80% of the respondents of the whole sample stated would have access to an ICU. However, in the whole sample, less than 50% would treat spinal cord injuries in intensive care unit. For this aspect, the most virtuous region was Europe and uh, Central uh, Asia, while in low-income countries, only 20% would treat spinal cord injuries in intensive care units. When speaking about uh, uh, spinal cord injury, one of the hot topics is surely uh, the timing to surgical decompression. The last WFNS guidelines recommend to perform uh, spinal decompression as soon as possible within 24 hours from injury and possibly within eight hours. These graphs uh, shows in the first column, the whole sample, and in the subsequent columns, the geographic area. In the whole sample, little more than 50% would be able to operate spinal cord injuries within 24 hours, while remarkable differences can be seen among the different areas. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, around 60% would operate spinal cord injuries only 24 hours after injuries and 33, 34% 48 hours after injuries. Remarkable differences for these aspects were seen also uh, stratifying the result as per income regions. For example, in low income countries, two thirds would operate spinal cord injuries 24 hours after trauma. And in the more, more, most virtuous region, that is, mm, that is upper middle income countries, one third would operate spinal cord injuries 24 hours after trauma. Amongst the explored factors, uh, the most frequently reported were the availability of transport, the availability of surgical equipment, and the availability of diagnostics. One aspect that could, that could affect the timing to surgery is surely the cost of the operation. In the old sample, one out of four stated that patients or their family have to completely pay the operations. And paradox, paradoxically, Reducing the resources available in the region, there, is, there was an increase in the cases, in the rate of cases in which the patients have to completely pay their operation. Uh, to summarize, this is just to say that we examined also other parameters that include the use of steroids, the classification of spinal fractures, the reduction of cervical fixation, but uh, for time limits, I obviously can't show all the results. And if anyone is interested, they have been recently published in a special issue on global neurosurgery in brain and spine. However, the other results go towards the same direction. That is that in low and middle income countries, some recommendation of the current guidelines seem not to be applicable and applied. And that the differences amongst economic and geographic areas are relevant. So with the support of such data, we then moved to the next uh, stage of the project. That is the development of a so specific protocol of management for spinal trauma. What will ultimately differentiate such protocols of management is that they will be of course based on the evidences and on the current, gu and on the current guidelines, but they will contain an essential component. That is the experience of people uh, and professional who daily face the limits of working with the, in environments with the, not all the resources available. Um, the final output will be called Bootstrap for spinal trauma that stands, beyond, that stands for Beyond One Option of Treatment, a certified protocol for spinal trauma. Um, 
this uh, this project took uh, this uh, project took different phases, uh, a preparatory phase, a live consensus meeting, and a post meeting. In the preparatory phase, four groups of experts were created, coming from different areas of management of spinal trauma. Uh, some professionals were chosen from the pre-hospital phase, some from the emergency phase, some from surgery, and some for the intensive care phase of treatment. Professionals were chosen as having a significant experience in managing spinal trauma in the context with different level of resources and representing different geographic areas. A literature review of the existing guidelines was conducted and selected documents were provided to the participants before the meeting for their personal study. This was a very important step because these documents were the evidence-based foundation of the entire project. A set of questions were then formulated and sent in advance before the live meeting to all participants for personal study. The, the live event was held last year in Bogota, in Colombia, in occasion of the last WFNS World Congress. The, the groups met, aiming to develop a set of protocols uh, for each stage of care by a modified FE process. Initially, the um, participants worked facilitated by a methodological team and basing the discussion on the question they received, the, the document they study and their personal experience. Then the draft, the draft of the protocols were presented to all participants and approved by everyone. The outputs of the consensus meeting were some draft of protocols on which to base the design of flexible algorithms of management. And this is the phase in which we are currently are as done on a previous project, analogous project on traumatic brain injury, the protocols are being refined and translated into algorithms of management for easy access and consultation. The products, the algorithms will be joined in a final document that will be circulated to all the participants to the, to the project and a scientific endorsement uh, will be requested and the two institutions, the two scientific societies that are, that are currently supporting the, this effort are the WFNS Neurotrauma Committee and the ENS Global and Humanitarian Neurosurgery Committee. The final outputs will then publish in, in a paper. For the, the idea for the future uh, of these protocols is to, to reply what is ongoing for the analogous project on TBI, that is a first feasibility study in a small sample of institution to test the applicability of the protocols, the applicability of the algorithms, and whether or not they may affect patients' outcomes. If successful, the application of the protocols and the, of the algorithms could be extended to different scenarios and verify whether or not they may affect patient outcomes. Of course, uh, we, we are aware that this project won't be the ultimate solution to reduce the gap between high-income countries and low-middle-income countries uh, and to mitigate such inequities. And of course, we are aware there are, that there are several limitations to this rather new type of approach. However, in the survey we conducted in the, in the first phase, we asked to the participants, to the respondents, whether or not they believe that such type of approach could be useful to improve, to treat their outpatients and possibly to improve patient, patient outcomes. And nearly 96% completely agreed or agreed with this type of approach. Uh, to conclude, uh, this clearly motivates us to proceed further. And I would like to cite this, uh, um, to quote this genetist uh, of the last century that says, new ideas have four stages of acceptance. This is worth the first stage. This is worth the nonsense. Second stage, this is an interest but perverse point of view. Third stage, this is true but quite unimportant. Fourth stage, I already said so. And I like to believe that 
for this project, we are at least between the first and the second stage of acceptance. I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thanking you for listening to me and to thank all the participants to this project that are quite numerous that are supporting us with, uh, with this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolo, for informing us about this uh, project, which can be really helpful for the low and middle income countries to manage the spinal trauma. I would request Dr. Alberto to please make some comment uh, about Dr. Nicolo, which you know personally. Uh, Dr. Alberto? Yes, uh, thank you, Sachin. Uh, well, <clears throat> Dr. Nicolo Marchesini is a very brilliant young neurosurgeon, as you could uh, uh, guess from his presentation. And I think he has uh, the merit of you know, spending his time and efforts uh, doing something that it is not so obvious. He spent some uh, of his months during residency program uh, in Colombia, uh, as he said, uh, which is uh, not like uh, the States or uh, Japan or uh, a big uh, European country. Uh, it's a developing country. Uh, and as a developing country, it has some needs, some practical needs. And, you know, we often, uh, as young neurosurgeons, uh, focus on very fancy uh, techniques, very difficult surgeries, uh, outstanding, uh, you know, tumor or vascular uh, problems. But actually, the, the reality uh, in uh, most of the places are uh, trauma, are uh, spine, uh, are head injuries. And we must uh, always know about this because the majority of people need our help uh, in, uh, in these fields. And I think uh, uh, the merit uh, of people like Nicolò is to be able to understand this need uh, that patients uh, have and to try to establish some uh, uh, protocols uh, that could help the management of these patients, not only in developed countries, but mainly in developing countries. So uh, I want to thank Nicolò for this work and for his efforts uh, in doing this. I think uh, this should be an example to uh, many of us uh, it is very nice to uh, go to uh, very important uh, neurosurgical institutes, of course, but we also have at the same time to uh, focus on the most common needs of our patients in our countries. So uh, I think we can uh, uh, start the discussion. Uh, Sachin, if you agree, I would like to uh, hear, of course, our discussants' uh, opinion uh, and comments about uh, this uh, presentation. So maybe uh, as usual, uh, Professor Arion Muzambeliu, maybe you want to say some words about that? Yes, I'm actually honored and it's a privilege to have the opportunity. So if I will uh, be allowed, I'll uh, start and if my, my, my comments, a few words in Italian. <laughs> Dottore Marchesini, veramente un, uh, un display di un lavoro straordinario. Uh, ti can, uh, I would say outstanding. It's a, it's a work that uh, I would uh, kindly suggest you consider it extended uh, with permission from the colleagues that contributed to what you have done to, uh, to a graduate level uh, publication and possibly a PhD work included into that. It is important uh, that we see soon some results out of it, but I know it will take time. And for that, I thank you and all of your colleagues who have been in the field right there at the trenches where the problems are and to see firsthand what in reality is needed. Um, what, uh, what we really have to understand is that, yes, Alberto is correct, most of cases uh, that we deal, especially in low and middle income countries, 
are those of traumatic injuries of a brain or in spine and are requiring protocols that serve specifically to these countries is much needed. And uh, I hope uh, the results of the work that you all are conducting would come soon to light so we better know what we are at to deal with. I come from a country of uh, low income and that's Albania. And I see and I've seen and I, I have been uh, one of those physicians who had to deal and care with patients under restricted infrastructure facilities and uh, limited instrumentation. And I hope for me, myself and colleagues to soon see the results. Vi, uh, vi direi che avete fatto un lavoro veramente grande. I miei okay. sinceri complimenti. E in bocca al lupo a te e ai tuoi colleghi. Grazie, thank you. Thank you. thank you, Arion, also for your perfect Italian. So, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> uh, maybe we can uh, move on with the discussion. Uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Anyaku, you are also a discussant. Do you want to spend some comments, some words for this presentation? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abatu. Uh, thank you once more. Dr. Nicolo, uh, a very interesting presentation. Uh, well, I don't have uh, any question or additional comments. Uh, I appreciate you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there uh, any question from the audience? Uh, I see, uh, well, again, I see also Ben is uh, connected. Hello, Ben. Nice to Hello. see you. Hello, nice to see you all. And uh, it's my pleasure to meet you all again. And uh, so uh, for me, for the uh, Cruz uh, uh, lecture is well, one that impressive protocol that you have for a low middle income country. So my always my question is about for the, for the tra traumatic spinal uh, injury is uh, how willing that you would uh, decompress it at uh, the midnight. So uh, as mentioned by um, uh, Professor Michael, feeling that the time is spine. So I, I, I think uh, most of uh, most of us uh, think that um, uh, uh, early decompression as soon as possible uh, might be uh, one uh, major uh, school of thought. So uh, may I ask uh, the groups that um, in your center, do you think it is uh, achievable? And my second question is um, is tours is for your um, development of your protocol is about um how 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 is your view towards the use of uh, the high dose uh, that's a methasone uh when you when you uh, develop your protocol so what are the pros and cons and evidence that uh, you would consider when you are developing this po protocol concerning the use of the desamethasone Okay, thank you very much, Ben, for the for the questions. Uh, regarding the first question that you asked about the timing for surgical decompression, uh, I give my answer based on the current guidelines. That is, that the last WFNS guidelines recommend to perform surgical decompression within 24 hours from, from injury and possibly within eight hours from injury. And uh, as I personally currently live uh, and work in uh, high-income countries, we have all the possibilities to follow these guidelines. I mean, when we receive a patient, we immediately take, a, with spinal cord injury, we immediately take a CT scan and MRI, and as soon as possible, we uh, we perform a surgical decompression or, a, or an orthodontic if it's necessary. We have all the, luckily, we have all the equipment to, to do this. But we are aware that, uh, and with the team we are working with, that this is not the reality in, all, all, over, all over the world. So uh, there are the situation in, or out there are quite different. I mean, I just yeah. gave an example of an you know, hospital with a CT scan, but not an MRI, and that with a general surgeon, uh, but not a neurosurgeon. So in when we did our live uh, consensus meeting, we discussed about the topic. I mean, the one possible question was, was what to do if you have a spinal cord, cord injury 
but uh, and you maybe have the surgeon that can operate it, but you don't have a CT scan or an MRI. Could you operate a patient only based on your on an X-ray mm. if you have the possibility to do so? So this will be is will be part of the of the protocols and of the algorithms, and we will show this in the in the results. And to respond and to link you this to your second question, we we discussed about the use of desametazone in the consensus meeting, and uh, all the participants of the and based in the discussion on the the guidelines and on the current evidences. The, the, the panelists of neurosurgeons um, agreed not to recommend uh, the use of uh, of steroids in spinal cord injuries. This I can already tell you uh, already before the publication of the of the results of the protocols and the, the algorithms. So the use of steroids won't be present in this this type of uh, protocols. I see. So uh, just just another follow up question is uh, I forgot to ask about the rehabilitation. So uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, colleagues from uh, uh, some local country, for example, uh, in Yaku, uh, for example, could share about the difficulty that you face when you have uh, uh, concerning the spinal rehabilitation. So most of them, uh, uh, so, uh, most of them are awake, but uh, they have a different degree of uh, disability, like uh, uh, hemiplegia, paraplegia, or even tetraplegia. Some might even encounter a breathing problem that uh, they fail to win up the uh, ventilator. So maybe, um, maybe, um, maybe, uh, co maybe colleagues uh, here can share about the difficulty that they encounter uh, during their spinal rehabilitation in a low middle uh, in a low income country. Yes. May. I Yes, hello, Professor Farad. Uh, hello, hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's a uh, uh, nice presentation and uh, good uh, survey. And uh, but unfortunately, uh, we we not uh, take part. Uh, we didn't take part in this survey. Uh, I don't know. But uh, uh, we like to follow the guideline. And as you as you mentioned, unfortunately in Afghanistan, in this uh, uh, it's a low uh, income country. And uh, uh, if you agree, and uh, you and Professor Kato, uh, maybe uh, I in the future I present uh, uh, a topic about neurosurgery and uh, but limited resources like Afghanistan. As you mentioned, in our uh, public centers, we haven't, uh, even in the capital, we haven't uh, MRI in the public uh, hospitals. And uh, in, in two centers, we have uh, CT scan, but in other centers, we haven't, only we have uh, X-ray uh, machine. But, uh, and uh, you know, in the operating room, we haven't uh, fluoroscope and uh, navigation and unfortunately, but we try to do uh, sometimes with uh, three hands. And uh, uh, also uh, you mentioned about the neuro rehabilitation, unfortunately, uh, we have rehabilitation centers, but not <coughs> neuro rehabilitation centers. As you know, the neuro rehabilitation is a, a, a special uh, uh, Subspeciality of rehabilitation, and uh, I was in the neuro rehabilitation committee of WFNS, and uh, I pr uh, proposed that to make a center in Afghanistan and also a neuroscience institute in Afghanistan, and we would like to your support and uh, every colleagues and all over the world that's uh, uh, to. Please help us because uh, the other thing is, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are uh, locked border. <laughs> we can't go out and can't import some things. But if we have a, a training center in, inside Afghanistan and invite uh, professors and uh, for training and doing, uh, it's better 
to send the uh, colleagues to outside and uh, uh, it's uh, my opinion and uh, I, I would like to uh, have a, a presentation about the neurosurgery with limited resources. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Berberg. And uh, it was uh, really a good presentation and the view uh, likes to follow and follow this uh, guideline as well. And uh, we also share uh, Professor Salman Sharif and uh, the Spine Committee <coughs> recommendation uh, among our friends as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pirzad, for these uh, comments. Uh, I think uh, there should will be uh, chances to um, further uh, improve this uh, project, but also other projects uh, that can be useful for uh, uh, low uh, income uh, countries. Uh, so Sachin, maybe uh, it's time to uh, go to a conclusion of this uh, wonderful webinar. So maybe you want to take over. Yes. So if no other comments or suggestion from anybody, uh, then uh, I would request uh, Prof. Kato to say a few uh, uh, closing words uh, about the presentation of all the speakers and uh, the enthusiasm of the, all the participants today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as for the Nicole, uh, your presentation was excellent. Uh, because uh, the trauma is the most difficult field, so either uh, the spine or brain. But I think uh, as a, as a doctor, that we want to, as a, as a family maybe uh, they want to know the prognosis or prediction of the results. I think uh, in the future maybe you can uh, research more about the, uh, either the image or some other uh, methodology, just you can tell us what is the most, uh, uh, the quick and the past uh, prediction of the, of the patient, the future result, I think. It's, it's very interesting here, here uh, lecture. Thank you very much. And also what another sensei is, uh, I, I think he left. Uh, and he, I think uh, endoscope. He's there. Oh, OK, OK. What another sensei, yeah, I think endoscope is one of the, the very the promising the future the uh, uh, the treatments you know, of course other with uh, exoscope plus endoscope uh, I think more and more uh, uh, the less invasive the both the doctor and the, the patients is more important in the future and also in, in Japan we are the facing to the, the uh, working hours limitation. So in the future, the, maybe the maybe the three uh, clipping surgery can maybe ten we can uh, uh, the treat by endovascular. So I think uh, in that means is uh, the treatment uh, the uh, way will be the changing in, in a very near future. So in, in the, all over the world, I think. So I think uh, today uh, we had a very nice uh, lecture uh, with uh, person, uh, Alexander and also the uh, Robert. Thank you very much for joining. Even you're very busy and very uh, okay. difficult, difficult time. Uh, yes. See the news. So so many uh, severe situation in both of your country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arigato. Arigato okay. so Maybe we'll see you again. Okay. Yes, so I have a few announcements to make. Yeah, so let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, first announcement is about about next webinar. The next webinar will be on 26th of February, and uh, we will have Professor Andrea Demetrius, who is the president of European Association of Neurological Surgeons, and uh, he'll also talk about acute uh, traumatic spinal cord injuries. And uh, young uh, 
female neurosurgeon from Brazil, Dr. Glossy Alexi, will talk about the reconstructive methods of facial nerve surgery. So please take a note of that and uh, you can count on this webinar, especially the spinal surgeon. About our uh, another virtual uh, conference, uh, which will be on February 18th, uh, it will start at 3 p.m. Japan time. Uh, and uh, this is especially in collaboration with the uh, uh, president of Neurosurgical Societies of Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, it will be on 18th of February. Uh, next is about uh, uh, the ACNS Bangladesh uh, hybrid workshop, which will be from uh, 2nd to 5th March. Uh, and uh, they have a beautiful pre-conference workshop about Professor Aibcherian is coming there, about spell base, Professor Abhida Shah, about white fiber dissection, Professor Kubayama will be performing a live uh, endovascular surgery and there is an endovascular simulation workshop and Professor Tak uh, Takizawa who will perform a live bypass surgery workshop and along with that we'll have a young neurosurgeon session there. So if any uh, young neurosurgeon wants to uh, enjoy the pre-conference workshop and want to participate in the young neurosurgeon session, please, uh, we still have time, you can apply for it about our second World Congress of Young Neurosurgeon, which will be in the 29th July to 1st August, full of different various workshop and uh, uh, the abstract submission is open for that. So I would request all the enthusiastic young neurosurgeon to please come and enjoy this pre-conference workshop, which will be uh, lectured and uh, chaired by one of the eminent of that particular specialty. And you can also participate in the a young neurosurgeon award session. There is a small video presentation of that. And I have one more announcement to make just before we close. It's about uh, uh, for our young neurosurgeons from Central Asia. We'll be having a special uh, 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 a conference, a hybrid conference for young neurosurgeons from Central Asia. And that will be from uh, uh, 15, uh, 16 and 17th of September. And we will conduct it in Uzbekistan. And it will be in collaboration uh, with all the presidents and neurosurgical societies of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, and the president and the chair secretaries of that. Uh, just one minute, yeah. Uh, we will have uh, beautiful sessions about uh, glioma surgery, about neuroanatomy, about skull based tumors, about cerebrovascular moyamoya disease endovascular surgery and functional neurosurgery, uh, neurotrauma and perioperative management, specifically complication, neurospine and pediatric neurosurgery. And along with that, it, we will have a, a pre-conference workshop about microvascular and endoscope, endovascular neurosurgery and a young neurosurgeon session. So there are all the education activities we planned for this year. So I would request all the young neurosurgeon, please take a note of that. Um, wherever uh, you are... Uh, uh, possible, please try to attend the pre-conference workshop and the Young Neurosurgeon Award session. So thank you very much. We'll see you next time uh, on 26th of February, 7 p.m. Uh, Japan time. Thank you very much. Arigatou Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Arian, how do you say in, in Italy? Uh, thank you. Thank you. See you later.
Well, I, I can yeah. I can try both, but I don't think I'll take the stage in Italian. So I'll start in Albanian. Shum falem derit, mir pafshim, which means thank you very much and goodbye. And I'll say it in Italian, but please uh, don't get mad at me if quality is not as the way Alberto or Nicola would say. Mille grazie, ci vediamo. Oh, Bye. mille grazie, ci vediamo. Thank you.